Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you with a greeting word of peace. We say it in Arabic, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon all of you. <coughs> it's a great pleasure for IFM to welcome your excellencies to this important workshop on its standard, specifically Islamic hygiene standard, collateralized murabaha standard, alternate to repo, and unrestricted wakala standard. Hosted, of course, by Clifford Chance. Our deep, deepest thanks and appreciation for the Clifford Chance, for the wonderful cooperation in the preparation of this workshop. Now it is an honor for me to invite the Honorable Mr. Malcolm Sweeten, senior partner Clifford Chance, London, to deliver his welcome remarks. Please join me to welcome. And I will just echo um, that welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm Malcolm Sweeting, senior partner of Clifford Chance. And we're delighted to be um, hosting this workshop this morning. And in particular, I'm delighted to be here welcoming everyone because uh, my first experience with Islamic finance, I can let you know without undermining um, Habib's credibility at all, uh, actually was in 1985 before Habib had actually yet sort of started developing his knowledge, experience and expertise around, around Islamic finance. Um, of course, Habib very quickly overtook me in terms of experience and expertise, and I haven't really focused on it since, but it's always been uh, a ver very, very fond memories of working in Bahrain for four years and being introduced to Islamic, um, Islamic finance, which, to my mind, then, was very cutting-edge, very complex, and very in innovative work, and it still continues to be so. But from those days back in 1985, when I was in Bahrain, uh, the global market for is, uh, Islamic finance has increased exponentially, although it's still relatively modest, and now exceeds uh, $2 trillion. And it's forecast to exceed $3.5 trillion by 2021, which again, I think, is modest, but sustainable growth, uh, and I think that is really no bad thing. Islamic finance is now a very material segment of the global financial markets, and indeed, it's a, a global product and market uh, with new financial institutions opening recently in countries from Australia to Nigeria to Oman to Pakistan uh, to Russia. And if we look at the Clifford Chance Network, the Clifford Chance Network also has Islamic finance capability across many, many um, of its offices, uh, and including um, some very deep expertise here in London. It's entirely appropriate, uh, I think, that today's workshop is in London. London is the top Western centre for Islamic finance, and there are now over 20 banks in the UK that offer Islamic financial services, and five fully uh, Sharia-compliant banks which are licensed. 780, 728 million of net assets of Islamic funds in the UK and 65 Sukuk have been listed uh, on the LSE, totaling 48 billion. So all of that, I think, is very, very positive for London and London's place in what is a growing, growing market for uh, Islamic finance globally. And indeed, there is this growing global demand for skills uh, as Islamic finance uh, expands. And Clifford Chance is positioning itself through its global network at the forefront of some of the developments in Islamic finance. And this is a very exciting area to which we are uh, very, as a firm, very, very committed and have been since our origins in the Middle East way back in the 1970s and the 1980s. And in a decade of what has been tremendous financial upheaval since the onset of the financial crisis in 2007, Islamic finance, I think, offers some of the more significant opportunities uh, for the future of the global financial markets and sustainable um, development. And with the Sharia assets only making up 1% of world's financial assets, the potential, of course, is considerable. Two important elements are required for the uh, internationalization of Islamic finance. And these are liquidity and the ability to hedge um, risks such as FX risk. And I'd like to congratulate uh, the IIFM on the work, the huge amount of work that it has done in developing standards for the market for both hedging and liquidity management. And I'm delighted that Clifford Chance is able to host this workshop today in which you will hear about all of the work that has been, the important work that has been done in this area. And we and our colleagues, both here and at ISDA, and a particular thanks to ISDA, have been extensively involved, and we're very proud and we're very delighted to be with you today hosting, hosting this workshop. So thank you very much for coming along, and please do enjoy the day. Thank you.
Thank you. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And very good morning to all. Uh, once again, thank you to Dr. Chance. Thank you to all of you uh, who have come, and I hope some more would be coming because our registration was uh, showing a higher number. So, but in any case, it's uh, indeed a pleasure to welcome you all here. And uh, today we will be, uh, our aim is to focus on the technical aspects of these standards, uh, which we have seen over the last uh, at least three, four years. Uh, the implementation is taking place and we receive a number of uh, queries at time uh, about different aspects uh, of and mechanism and how this has worked and they have been used, these standards in some cases, uh, at least on the liquidity management side uh, by certain uh, central banks as well in their facilities and they have been sort of, so we are contributing not only in the institution but also at the regulatory level in terms of providing Sharia compliant facilities in a unified manner, uh, which is a huge task. Uh, and we have been, because of the support of the industry, are able to carry on. Um, from IFM perspective, uh, just very briefly, we are currently now doing something in the trade finance related documentation. Uh, some work is being done on the risk participation agreement for funded and unfunded facilities, as, as, as well as there will be something coming out, which is on the Sukuk, which is most talked about uh, instrument in Islamic industry and was one of the most important ones. Uh, but today what we sort of would like to do is just focus on the standards which are already there uh, and to explain how these are sort of developed and how it's been able to, you know, we're achieving the unification. Of course, there is still uh, challenges which we have to work together to achieve, you know, the level of uh, standardization uh, which we have seen in the conventional market. We identified the need of risk mitigation in early 2006 and when we started at that time, if you recall, there was financial crisis. So naturally <coughs> we had to you know, explain a lot, not only to the Islamic banks about the requirement, industry was not really at that time, if you see at least if you look at Sukuk, the number of Sukuk being issued in different currencies, the rate fluctuation was not really understood. And then, if, if you recall, also the derivative, the speculative part, not the hedging part, it was also be, to be blamed at that time. That's maybe the financial crisis because of this overplay in the market uh, and speculative activity has perhaps contributed in that. So we had to work very hard to explain the reasoning behind this. And we are happy to see now that generally it is understood. It's most of the countries are looking into it, uh, even in some African countries which are new to coming into the market, is also looking into this. ISDA and IFM are working on this hedging for the last 10 plus years. And this is indeed a pleasure to be working with ISDA. And Peter, we are all thankful to ISDA and we had a good cooperation level in terms of working together in terms of IFM providing uh, you know the process when we are building the Sharia guiding process and all and eventually looking at the legal creating the legal certainty uh, which is highly important and if you look at it generally you have to see how the legal will work and how Sharia when it's not codified how it will sort of work together so that's something which I'm sure Abhi will also cover but that is what we try to do and we have been successful in doing that and we are continuing to uh, look into some other areas as well. Uh, the how document now is at least six, seven years old now uh, when we produced. So this was you know, something which we achieved. And now what we were able to do uh, last March or this March is that we have produced the credit support document. So there was a whole package which is now there for us, uh, at least the basic requirement of the industry we are able to put together in a standardized manner. We also, if you look at it in terms of the master agreements which existed in the market, of course there were some good agreements there, uh, no doubt, but in this unified manner, given the ISDA, in the conventional, uh, we have seen, you know, now 
something emerging in which is a good thing, a unified master agreement under that you developed. So I have explained you know, generally what, how we have been working together in the last 10 plus years and how sort of through our working groups uh, we have able to produce through a consultative process we are able to define what needs to be done. And now what we are sort of looking into is the <coughs> next phase of development in the hedging segment is to see what kind of other products for risk mitigation, perhaps maybe some products are there which are not really speculative, but from the investment point of view, uh, with the element of risk mitigation in there, uh, that perhaps can be now looked into it. Uh, we look forward to you know, uh, receiving sort of feedback from the industry which we are collecting, and uh, we would be planning some consultative meeting uh, at least next year, uh, hopefully in the beginning of next year. So with that note, I would like to uh, Thank you for you know, just giving me an opportunity to give you a brief about you know, where we were and where we are today. And we would uh, now sort of move into, without wasting time, uh, into actual sort of documentation side. Uh, and this next slide comes, I will... What we have now, uh, it's total of seven standards uh, which has been produced. The main master underneath you have profit rate swap which is uh, interest rate equivalent because we do have in Islamic industry uh, reference rate we use for both uh, floating and fixed rate. So that needs to be mitigated. We have uh, two structures under that, so two separate standards. Uh, we have standard on cross currency which is the major thing. I recall some 10, 12 years uh, with Islamic Development Bank. Uh, I was visiting when I was, or it's more than that, it's about 15 years, so I'm dis disclosing my age, uh, is uh, that uh, when I was in the bank and I covered uh, Islamic Development Bank, uh, I mean, they said we have a huge sort of, you know, yen liquidity, but we, we cannot do anything with that. You know, that's, you know, we, we get this money from various contributors. So that is something it's been done also, and there is one standard on that. Then we have two standards uh, on the FX forward, uh, which is very much sort of was needed, which has been done also. And then we have standard on credit support deed, which has been done for the cash uh, side of it at the moment. And that could be for next year, uh, we would be looking into the security side for, for the uh, credit support deed. So that could be a potential next year project which uh, we would be looking into uh, to start there. With that note, I will invite Habib, who again we have a pleasure of working for a fairly long time, uh, to give his sort of you know, insight on the Havad Master Agreement as well as credit support deed. And then I will sort of give you some uh, input on uh, the product side of it. So Habib. <clears throat> Thank you, Sir, and uh, my welcome too to everyone. <coughs> so, we want to spend a few minutes um, just looking at the, uh, the, the documentation framework that we've developed uh, for the um, Islamic hedging transactions. And as you know, um, the starting point for that is the uh, Tahuat Master Agreement, the TMA. And um, to those who have been involved in the conventional hedging markets, um, the structure of this will look very familiar, uh, and, and, and that was something that was um, intentional. We wanted something that people could use um, you know, with familiarity. And so a lot of what you see uh, is very much uh, similar um, to the ISDA master agreement, and of course, uh, ISDA has been very much involved in the development of this document um, alongside IRFM. And so like the ISDA Master Agreement, the Tawak Master Agreement uh, is a Master Agreement, it's a framework agreement, uh, and what it brings to the party, if you will, 
um, is the ability to set terms over transactions which will allow, um, uh, crucially, close out and netting arrangements to operate um, in the event of a default situation. But, but as with any master agreement, uh, you do also have, of course, all the other basics that you need or you, you would like to see, things like representations, undertakings, um, the full list of events of default and so on. And so the TMA sits on top of then the series of product specific documents uh, that, that uh, Israel has mentioned and which have been developed, some of which have been developed and which others are, over time I'm sure uh, will also be developed. So as things stand, um, we have documentation for property rate swaps, for Islamic cross-currency transactions uh, and for FX forwards. And it's worth saying, picking up on something that Ijla was mentioning, that um, the, the focus on these particular products was the result of a market consultation. Um, it was a response to what was coming through from the market as the priorities uh, for the market to, um, to, to see. So um, what we have at the moment is those documents uh, and of course uh, during, as, again, as I mentioned, during the course of the last 12 months, <coughs> what's been developed is collateral documentation to sit alongside that. If you look at the um, publication by, the, by IFM and ISDA at the time the TMA was published, there actually are um, two documents, the, the TMA itself, uh, but alongside that, uh, was an explanatory memorandum and, and much of that is obviously just running through the document explaining to you how, how it works uh, but importantly it includes in it the um, guidelines or some guidelines that we uh, synthesised if you will with the Sharia scholars regarding the use of the TMA um, and the products more <coughs> generally and, and, and hedging products more generally um, and it's worth just reminding people, I know, you know many of you here um, will have been involved, so we'll remember this, but um, for those who, who weren't, I mean, the whole process of developing the TMA was quite a lengthy process. It was something like around four years in the, in the making. Um, and a large part of that was a very, very detailed discussion and examination by the scholars um, the IFM panel um, in relation both to the content of the document itself, the master agreement itself, but also looking at how it would be used, the potential products to be used with it and so on. So um, it really does uh, embed a, a really considerable amount of thought uh, regarding suitability, if you like, in an Islamic context. And so this, these set of guidelines that were then uh, included uh, in the expansion memorandum really kind of encapsulate you know, quite a lot of thought and discussion uh, uh, about that usage. And so, um, and none of this I think should be a surprise particularly, but obviously the basic principles that need to be observed in using the documentation is the use of it for hedging of actual risks <clears throat> not speculation, um, actual transfers, real assets, uh, obviously um, halal assets, and of course um, no uh, interest charging included. So, in many ways, I mean, going back to the point about hedging, you know, the whole discussion was really around, you know, is there a, you know, is this whole question of, you know, are derivatives something that, that from a Sure point of view are acceptable and you know what's very very clear is hedging managing your risk he through hedging is a, um, a perfectly acceptable sensible prudent thing to be doing <coughs> so I say I, I dwell on that a little bit because I know we still even though it is now some years since the TMA was published you know occasionally we still do get um, that discussion and I think it really is something that, that you know, I think we can all regard 
Um, the position is absolutely clear. <coughs> in, um, in developing how the TMA would work as a master agreement with underlying documentation. Thank you, Peter. Um, of course, a lot of the focus was on the mechanism that would be used for closing out. But in a way, sort of coming backwards from that, uh, we also had to look at the way um, transactions would be structured. And so there are, you know, although a lot of what's in the TMA is probably very, very familiar to you if you're, if you're familiar to conventional documentation, um, you know, there are certain aspects which obviously had to be developed, you know, specifically for the, the Islamic context. And, and I suppose the you know, in a way, the biggest um, uh, difference uh, and structural I arrangement, if you like, is this division was creation of th something that's called a transaction with a capital T and then something that's called um, DFT terms uh, arrangements. And DFT stands for designated future transactions. And, and so in very simple, using a very simple example, the distinction that was being drawn was between, for example, a Murava transaction that has been entered into, where, for example, the asset has been delivered, um, but the, the, the payment pri the purchase price is deferred and outstanding, and that's a transaction which has been entered into. People have started performing it, um, and, and obviously there are certain elements of that transaction which are unperformed as yet, but the basic transaction is a is a live transaction versus something like a, uh, a WAD type arrangement with a view to entering into Murava transactions in the future. So um, the profit rate swap structure that, that you'll see in the uh, documentation developed for profit rate swaps adopts this WAD plus Murava arrangement and the, the period of time between the original trade being entered into um, and a specific uh, uh, Murava for a given period being entered into is effectively covered, if you will, through the entry of a WAD, which was then exercised, um, a, a WAD or undertaking, which is then exercised uh, when it gets to the appropriate uh, period of time in order to um, generate that cash flow. Uh, and so, because that's not a transaction that's still been entered into yet, that, that's still a sort of future transaction, uh, we develop this uh, label or term if I call the DFT terms arrangement. And the, and the reason for dwelling on that uh, is because, of course, when you get to looking at how you will deal with closeout and netting, it, it, the sort of conventional language, if you will, of just taking all transactions and um, pulling them all together doesn't fit completely uh, that structure, that arrangement. So a lot of the uh, discussion with the scholars went into uh, working out an appropriate way of handling that situation. And although it's quite complicated to, um, to sort of elaborate, it's actually relatively straightforward once you kind of get the hang of it. Um, and effectively, what it is doing is that where you've got um, delivered transactions where you have, in effect, a purchase price outstanding, you accelerate that payment obligation and fully delivered transactions is really looking at those sorts of arrangements where the asset has been delivered but we've got um, a purchase price or some similar payment outstanding uh, and, and, and that is going to become due but on a closeout you are accelerating that. And then as regards the, the WAD or, the, or the, more, the more general DFTs, designated future transactions, what you're looking at generating um, is effectively a replacement cost um, for them. Um, there's a slight complication because you have to address the situation of where you've got a, a transaction which has been entered into, but the payment, um, the delivery itself hasn't happened yet. So, for example, if you had a, a Muraba where we entered into it today, um, it, we've got a spot delivery of the relevant asset, but in fact, insolvency happens, um, say, later, to, later the same day, so before delivery of the asset has actually taken place. 
So even though that's a live transaction that's been entered into and initiated, in fact, neither side has been performed under that transaction, not just the cash side, but the asset <coughs> side as well has also, as a, as a reality, not actually been implemented. Um, and in very simple terms, what you do with that is you pull it out and you deal with it in the same way as you do with the designated future transactions. In other words, you deal with it via the replacement cost valuation um, exercise. So, although it's a little bit complicated, um, it still gets you, you well, once you get the hang of it, I think it's sort of relatively straightforward of simply taking things that already become due, even though deferred, accelerating them, and then working out a replacement cost um, for the balance. Um, but in terms of the mechanism for uh, working out that replacement cost, <coughs> um, the exercise uh, is again slightly complicated because what is fundamental from the point of view of the, um, the Sharia compliance um, is that if there are going to be payments, they should be associated with transactions or real transfers of assets and so on. And so uh, the way that's incorporated into the documentation is through creating, in effect, um, uh, another, uh, another what or another undertaking to enter into a transaction. That transaction is actually a Musama transaction, and that Musama transaction has a price attached to it, which is effectively the value of the asset that's being um, transferred together with the replacement cost amount that's been determined. And the replacement cost amount that's been determined is actually expressed as an index amount. So when you come to do your, if you're the non-defaulting party, for example, and you trigger an event of default, when you come to do your closeout calculation, let's say you're, you're, you're accelerating and aggregating the sums that, are, that have become payable under, for example, Moravia transactions, and to look at it in a sort of conventional sense, it's a bit like treating them as unpaid amounts. Um, and when it comes to the remainder of the transactions, you're looking at a loss or replacement cost type for valuation, which you then express in terms of an index, which obviously is going to be positive or negative, depending on whether you are in or out of the money, uh, and then a Musama transaction is entered into, which will be the vehicle through <coughs> which the value that needs to be transferred um, is going to be transferred. So if you're the non-defaulting party and you're the one who's in the money, you will actually exercise the word of the counterparty to enter into a Musama with a view to delivering an asset to that counterparty um, for a purchase price which will give you the value of the asset plus that index amount. Okay. Um, obviously there are a few complications involved in all of that, um, not the least being what happens if the counterparty doesn't um, perform, so you are the non-defaulting party You've given the what? You've given the undertaking, uh, the notice to exercise the uh, undertaking of the counterparty. Um, you're ready to deliver your asset uh, under the Masama transaction, and the counterparty doesn't perform on his side. Well, in, look, in very simple terms, what's happening is the counterparty is failing to perform under a purchase trans an obligation to purchase. Um, there's a damage associated with that failure to perform, um, and that damage, in very simple terms, is actually, in effect, the mark-to-market or the index amount, um, or the replacement cost amount. So, actually, there's a mechanism built into the document which allows you to establish whether or not the counterparty is going to perform, and if it's not going to perform, to allow you to avoid having to go through the um, practicalities of a, of a cell delivery where you know the counterparty is not going to deliver or not going to perform, but still give you the claim that you need in order to be able to process and deal with the agreement as a whole. 
Um, there was also, of course, um, a discussion about what happens if, in fact, it's the defaulting party that is in the money. Um, in other words, actually, what we need to have is a transfer of value to, um, to the defaulting party because, in overall terms, that's the party that's in the money. <coughs> and again, the issue is, how do we deal with the, issue, the problem if the defaulting party simply doesn't do anything um, and doesn't activate the undertaking which the non-defaulting party has given. Um, and at a certain point, we obviously can't deal with that anymore because you know, it is down to the defaulting party to do something. But we also didn't want to have a situation where the non-defaulting party is kind of left in limbo forever, not knowing whether this um, uh, undertaking that it gave is ever going to get triggered. Uh, and so as a compromise uh, as a, and, a, and really as a practical arrangement, um, what we uh, agreed with the scholars as a way forward was that we put a time limit on the exercise of that word of the undertaking by the defaulting party of one year. In other words, we recognise the defaulting party, particularly in circumstances of insolvency, you know, in the immediate aftermath of insolvency, you know, there's a lot going on potentially the party's not going to be in a position to deal with all the transactions and relationships that it has, but we provided for a year's grace, if you will, in which it can you know, get on top of the situation, realise that there's actually value available to it, exercise its rights under that uh, agreement and capture that value. Um, and if after a year they haven't done it well, then it's unfair to ask the, the non-defaulting party to continue sitting there in limbo. And so that was an arrangement which, again, we discussed in some detail with the scholars and, and as a sort of fair way of dealing with the issue, um, they felt comfortable with that. Um, the, the one thing I would say, and a lot of what's on here I've just explained, but the one thing I would, ex would mention again is that in order to implement the, the, the payment of the closeout <coughs> amount, um, you do need to see, the scholars were clear that they wanted to see a real transaction, which is the, the basis on which that Masama or purchase and sale transaction is provided for. So that that's, sets out the, the framework agreement and the sort of the key mechanism in it for closeout. As I said, it's got all the other things that you'd expect to have, things like representations, um, governing law provisions, and so on. Strictly speaking, there's a choice of governing law. Um, I, mean, I think the practical reality is, by and large, we see the agreements entered into governed by English law, although the option for New York law is, is actually there. And it's also maybe worth mentioning, and this is something that Peter may also expand on, but um, in terms of dispute resolution, um, there's a choice of, uh, of, of mechanism built into the agreement, so you can either choose court, uh, um, and if in English law, you would choose English court in principle, um, but you can also choose arbitration, and um, there is a specific arbitration, submission to arbitration clause built into the agreement, which if the parties agree, um, they can activate, uh, and using arbitration as well, and I think that was one of the first documentations in the ISDA suite of documents which actually had arbitration built into it as an option um, from day one. Um, we're going to hear later about the, other, the underlying products. I'm just going to say a few more words now about um, the, 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 the most recent document that's been produced, which is the credit support um, deed for uh, actually cash collateral. And of course, the broader context behind all of this is regulatory changes, as you all know, um, have been um, increasingly requiring that relationships, um, if they are not cleared, uh, if, uh, if they're going to be in the over-the-counter market, need to be collateralised. And so how we achieve that in, you know, in, the, in an arrangement where the TMA, the Trial Master Agreement, is the basic document, you know, was, the, was the ask, if you will, from the, from the market. <coughs> and so... IFM and ISDA have developed a document to go with that. It's a credit support deed, so it's a, it's a security arrangement, it's a security document. 
um, and the underlying asset, collateral asset that it provides for at the moment is cash. Um, and it's worth just saying that, that, again, there was a lot of discussion about this, a lot of discussions about what the options were. Um, and I think the imperative, in a way, was to develop a document that would work um, very substantially for, for, for most people, recognising that this is not necessarily the end of the story um, in terms of, of, of collateralisation and collateral documentation, but at least to give the market a document that they can work with uh, alongside their, uh, their, their hedging documentation. And so, for example, the limitation to cash is not um, intended to be a sort of absolute limitation. It's really saying, right now, you know, we can look at, yes, obviously you can look at things like Sukuk as collateral, but they taking security over Sukuk, actually even the availability of Sukuk, all of that are things that need a good deal more thought. So for the moment, let's start with cash. What we found was the market was telling us that actually already there were a lot of collateralization arrangements in place using cash. So we were building on what many parties in the market operationally were already set up to deal with. And so the limitation to cash is really a practical limitation, not a, you know, not an in not first of all, not something that's share driven, and nor is it something that's intended ultimately, um, you know, to set the, the overall parameters. Um, and um, I guess the one other thing I'd say about the uh, credit support documentation is that it is written. It's an English law um, security document. Uh, so obviously, when you're using it, you will need to give some thought to whether your underlying TMA is an English law document or not. Um, as I said, mostly it is. If it weren't to be, obviously that doesn't mean you can't use the credit support document, but you need to give it a little bit of thought to how the two fit together. Um, you need, obviously, to look at the uh, exposure that you're collateralising because the way the credit support deed is written, it is looking at the, the, the contractually net exposure under the TMA um, and recognising that with some of the jurisdictions where the agreement is to be used, there are issues with netting, um, and, and Peter will talk about that shortly. Um, that does mean if you are in a regulatory environment where you, know, you have some constraints on operating off the net number as opposed to a gross number, um, you need to, again, look at how the agreement works and and see if you need to make some adjustments to deal with that. But, but as a basic uh, security mechanism, collateral mechanism, using cash, um, the hope is that what you have there is something that very much allows you to both address um, the regulatory requirements that are um, you know, increasingly now mandatory, but also clearly address, more importantly, the um, credit exposures that are associated with these transactions and recognising, of course, again, to go back to the point that Malcolm was making, that if you want to grow the market um, you know, and grow your relationships, clearly you need to be able to handle the increasing size of uh, exposures that potentially come along with that. So I'm actually going to stop there uh, and, and pass over, uh, I think, Ijana, you're going to talk about the, yes. the, the underlying transactions. <clears throat> we can get some if you want. Okay. Thank you, Habib. Uh, and once again, uh, there are a couple of ones uh, they are putting up the slides. Uh, I think it's the next one. Uh, I have a few things, uh, I think, just to uh, be brief, uh, briefly explain and some of the technical aspects, although I think we sometimes uh, need to look into a more detailed kind of a workshop where there are a lot more which one can sort of explain and present. Uh, but generally, if you look at the early termination and need for index, uh, that is something in Islamic finance we need to understand that simple calculation uh, by you know of profit and loss 
uh, is not really something which is allowed. So you have to have you know, a method to come out and it has to be the actual loss or actual profit. But if you have any damages, that has to be also based on <coughs> actual. So your opportunity loss, you, these kind of things you, you cannot take. And if you are transferring any uh, or recovering your loss, if you have to rehash the position, if early termination does happen, then you have to basically do a transaction which is through a musawama. And there is a slight you know, difference of those of you, I'm sure you are aware about the murabaha, which has been quite widely used. Uh, but musawama, there you have a whole sort of amount. So the, your principal and your sort of profit is not broken. So it's one amount which you calculate and that's the index amount. Unlike in Murahabaha, you have one profit amount and you have one principal amount, so you know. But at the same time, uh, we have put a condition there so that people cannot really over claim or overcharge in terms of the quantity. I think I don't remember which clause, but we have a clause which sort of defines the quantity. So that is part of there. So you sort of, what we are trying to achieve there especially from the Sharia point of view that what you are achieving, you are claiming something not extra, but actually what you have lost to recover. And if in case of any profit, then what you are saying is that needs to be passed. Again, I uh, explained that you have to have a transaction there. So you have to enter into a transaction. So we have to bring in this unique one year period which we discussed. Also the commercial aspect of that because you can't keep, if you have rehashed and if profit belongs to defaulting party then you cannot really keep that profit forever for that. So we sort of agreed that maybe one year would be enough if it's an extreme case of insolvency uh, case, then maybe in one year you know, uh, it can be sort of worked out and somebody will pick it up and actually will have to enter into a transaction. We also, I think maybe you can put, uh, you know, why we use the pledge versus the title transfer. So sort of a reasoning behind Sure. Um, um, there, there are really two aspects to that. One is, um, of course, your, <coughs> one of the points I mentioned is that you're operating in an environment where, in many cases, netting is not, um, not robust as things stand, although um, we know the picture is changing, but nevertheless, you know, we have to recognise that many of the jurisdictions um, which are a particular focus area for this, for the use of this documentation, are ones where netting is not robust. So, so, so as a as a sort of basic legal starting point, in a way, if you will, um, a mechanism like the credit support annex, for example, which will ultimately depend on set off and netting, clearly has practical issues um, associated with it. So that that's an important sort of starting point question. From a Sharia point of view, again, uh, one of the things that we've touched on a little bit, both is our uh, and me and the things that we've been saying is um, the scholars' concern to ensure that um, where payments are being made, they're being made associated with real transactions as, as part and parcel of real transactions and not just agreements to, to pay um, sums. Uh, and again, um, in order to uh, operate through a credit support annex or set off type arrangement, you know, that raises some of those sorts of issues um, uh, that, 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 you know, do cause a concern from a sure point of view. Um, on the other hand, security, the taking of security, the giving of security, is a perfectly well-known um, and, and well-provided for, if you will, um, legal approach, obviously, you know, used in the, in the broader financial context um, for many, many uh, decades. Uh, and so credit support deed using a security structure was um, both from a Sharia point of view something perfectly recognisable and acceptable but also <coughs> from the point of view of dealing with the issues that lack of netting would, would give rise to is obviously something that would allow us to address those issues as well. And so again um, uh, the, the starting point of the credit support deed is a security uh, over uh, over the over the, uh, the the cash that's um, being used as the collateral asset. Um, 
you know, I, I want to make the point again that um, this isn't seen as the end of the road. You know, we are seeing um, reforms from the from the legal point of view, which are which are helping with in relation to uh, netting. You know, the the Sharia discussion um, continues in terms of finding uh, a pro Sharia appropriate ways uh, of addressing some of the uh, structural um, re requirements that we have. So. You know, this is very much a kind of starting point and a document that the market can take and use right now, recognising that over time further documentation may be developed to sit alongside it uh, and to use uh, with the TMA. Thank you, Vip. And also, if you look at it from the Sharia point of view, especially uh, when you're talking about the collateral, uh, and if you're taking collateral, then title transfer is something which is, uh, you know, in Sharia is something not preferred. So it's uh, the pledge mechanism which has been used. And I'm sure in the collateralized uh, arrangement uh, session, maybe you can cover in terms of how, you know, uh, you know, the recovery in terms of, uh, you know, especially if you have a collateral, what would be the sort of uh, the impact in some cases this issue has been raised. But that's sort of a thing which we had to work it around. And so these are the one which I mentioned, these are, you know, we have produced which was at, uh, uh, earlier intention, which we it's done, IFM agreed in way back in 2006, in 2007, and you can see, uh, I hope appreciate that uh, you know how much effort one has to go through in putting together these standards which are there. So now uh, we have this package which is there, and we are going to move on. I will just cover on the point two to six uh, and uh, give you some sort of feedback or some input uh, on the products itself and the mechanism. Of course, I may request Habib also to help me in some cases. First, if you look at key takeaways uh, from this, when we developed our Tahoe document, we have uh, taken two sort of things. One contract, which is a Murabaha contract, and the promise, which is uh, uh, called Vaad, which is a binding promise here we are talking about. There could be non-binding as well, but these are the binding sort of uh, and undertakings, and we call it DFTs. Uh, and this is how, you know, it's been developed, and you can see that most of the, at, at the moment, the products are being done uh, on these basis. So we didn't have to have the need to uh, amend the TMA uh, as of now. Uh, there are some other uh, methods being used, such as uh, principle of a boon, which is more for short selling, uh, which is not really something we are looking at at the moment. So those are not really covered. There could be some more as we go along, as Habib was alluding. We might be able to add those, but at the moment, unless we see from the market and through our consultation, this is fairly meeting the market requirements. If you see the TMA value addition, naturally, uh, it's, uh, you are all are here and you can see you know, the importance and how sort of we are helping the industry as a whole in across the globe. So it's not one jurisdiction, but we have seen you know, in various jurisdictions, even in Far East also, uh, we have seen now the implementation, which is the key thing, so <coughs> we rely on the institutions uh, to help us in that case. We have seen some cases, some regulatory sort of, uh, which is always helpful for standard setting organization, uh, push to uh, move on to the, the Harvard documentation as a master agreement. So we have seen uh, clearly from Saudi Arabia, Bahrain in particular, and there are other also which may be looking into, uh, which we are under discussion. We have, if you look at in terms of the document architecture, uh, of course, ISDA has developed over the period, so document architecture is the same. But you can see in terms of the technicalities, uh, we have to go through a lot of changes. <coughs> so it's not simply we are just amending certain uh, words or certain element, but it has to be sort of reworked out, which we have been able to do. Uh, and one of the you know, examples, as we explained, is that through the index. We also, uh, through our partner ISRA, looking at the law reforms, uh, which is, uh, Peter will be covering. Uh, there are certain jurisdictions uh, which are now looking into, you know, close out netting laws and so on, blinces laws. So that, that work has been also, it is helping uh, in our effort to move in that direction as well. First, the profit rate swap. 
uh, which uh, I'm sure you're aware of the interest rate swap. So it's equivalent uh, to that. In Islamic finance, we use the reference rate, so that is still there. Uh, so that we have to rely uh, on the fixed rate and floating rate. Uh, if you pick up Sukuk, uh, by the way, we'll have some Sukuk reports for you to take, so we do some, some research on the Sukuk. Uh, if you've seen since, you know, this low, very level of uh, reference rates, whether LIBOR or other rates, uh, these are sort of uh, in terms of our, the market has moved more to the, towards the fixed rate, especially for Sukuk. But then we have also other transactions which does happen uh, in terms of that. So Sukuk at the moment you may not really, un unless the rates uh, start r rising in US and Europe, uh, we don't see really maybe you know that much need at times, <coughs> although it is needed in maybe in the local markets as well where the rates could be very different. So this is to cover because sometimes the institutions generally will have, uh, you know, more floating maybe, so they want to move to the fixed side of it, even in sukuks. If you see, uh, there could be long dated sukuks, uh, but sometimes you need to move into the floating side. So this is something which is there. And when you have sort of these streams of profit streams, uh, with its fixed and also with uh, floating rate, uh, you need to, as I try to explain, can simply cannot calculate and transfer that amount that was different. So that's why we had to use uh, a contract, which is a murahaba, which is fits into that. So if you look at other contracts, it doesn't really you know, fit into this, what we were aiming for. So that is very critical uh, to, to note that we have to have for to, you know, have this cash flow managed when you have you know, one fixed rate and one floating rate, so you have to enter into a murahaba. And then we, if you are doing three years for, uh, then you would be, uh, you know, doing several so period. It could be quarterly, it could be six month, or it could be yearly. So you could, you would be entering uh, into series of murabahas. So first requirement is, uh, if uh, generally, uh, I think initially maybe people uh, were sort of uh, using this uh, doc arrangement under their own master, but. Now we have seen it's uh, TMA, so you have already entered into the TMA, you have already signed off and you have kept it there generally. When I was in Treasury, I never noticed these documentation really when I was trading. So, but now I see the importance of those. So you generally, you know, you s keep it there, uh, it's signed and everybody knows, you know, their sort of uh, liabilities and their responsibilities, uh, what needs to be done, especially in case of early termination. Uh, also. In fact, um, one point I would like to also say that when we are doing for mark to market uh, in terms of the capital calculation so now which is required where for these uh, hedging transactions, you need to have you know calculation done on the uh, on some Islamic banks in particular. They, they have to do that for regular treatment purposes and the method which they have to move on is really the index method which we have explained. So that right now I know maybe it's not been done, but that's something, you know, as industry, especially the Islamic banks, have to look into that. Uh, that, that is something to be done as well. So you have uh, basically parties which uh, want to, you know, now enter into profit rate soft to hedge their respective <coughs> floating and fixed rate risk. Uh, the first thing you sign at the moment that they are slightly, when I explain uh, the FX forward, they're slight documentation architecture difference between the two. Uh, one reason could be that when we were developing uh, PRS and also cross-currency, uh, we were sort of, you know, looking at this document architecture because this is not really very frequent transactions. Uh, it is transaction by transaction. The transaction could be quite large also in some cases. So that is the whole sort of when you're signing, every time you're entering into new PRS document, you have a, you know, uh, about 7, 18 pages, I think we have something like that, which, you know, you sign uh, and they're separate sort of it. And these are sort of when you're signing this document, you know, you sort of each time then you also sign your designated future transactions, which are, uh, it's uh, your uh, undertakings, which you're keeping uh, for fixed and floating. So that will be, you know, you'll be exercising and I will explain uh, uh, 
very shortly that you know what will sort of you'll be doing. So you will sign when you are about to enter at your. Uh, you know. So you have your schedule, you have your fifth uh, DFT, you have floating DFT, respect, depending on the party which you know is choosing to do what. Uh, we once you exercise your DFT or your undertaking, you are basically will be leading to a murabaha. At that time, this will move to a transaction uh, with capital T uh, in the TMA. And I think when we are keeping designated, it's, it's I think it's a, it's not a cap one. Right? So this is, uh, I mean, if you notice, we, we have sort of this. So when you are exercising, you are basically, will be moving from DFT into a transaction itself with the murabaha. And you will be two, having two sets of sort of things which if early divination happens, you have to manage, you know, both. Maybe you want to put some point on this one? Um, but, well, it's really the, 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 the point that I was making before that, that um, you know, we have this division between transactions and designated future transactions. So when it comes, for example, in the profit rate swap, you know, when it comes to the actual payment of the... Um, uh, of the relevant profit amount, uh, you know, be it fixed or floating or whichever, um, that will be paid by way of purchase price in respect of uh, of the purchase of an asset under a Murabha transaction. But if you've got, say, a three-year uh, profit rate swap, you know, with you know, on day one with regard to the payments at the end of year two and the payments at the end of year three. You know, on day one, what you have is an undertaking to enter into a Muraba in the future, which will generate the relevant um, cash flow. And that undertaking today is what's called the designated future transaction. Um, you know, and that's, that's a little T for transaction. Thank you. And then you have, of course, <coughs> like we said, it had to actual transaction in Muraba, so delivery of assets respected and then you have a payment which could be uh, spot basis or deferred payment basis of course deferred will carry the risk of the transaction itself or the PA. You have two sales structures so to provide the flexibility to the through the industry a market and uh, we managed to you know and Asharia has, has the board has been able to you know look into that aspect and uh, put, uh, approve uh, the, these two structures. Uh, the two sales structures, you have uh, what a schedule, then you have you know one lakh which is covering your fixed part, uh, and the other one would be your floating rate. So you have your DFT, you exercise your notice, and then you actually enter into transaction, which could be on the spot basis or could be deferred basis. In the single sale structure, what will happen, it will be just one sort of murabaha is there instead of two streams of murabaha for the profit. So you are going to have just one, and I will give the example, that you will come out with one number which is based on meeting certain conditions. So instead of having two murabahas uh, to come out with the profit at the end, you will just exchange the difference of one amount, so instead of entering to, so that has also been provided, so probably operationally it is more easier to do a single, but it depends really on the institutions and they actually <coughs> how they want to do it, but both methods are fairly, you know, are approved and can be you know, widely used. This one is, uh, if you look at it from the, you know, transaction execution point of view, uh, it's, uh, this graph is explaining uh, for the start of the period, uh, you know, what would be the case when you're entering at the start of period, you have your excise date, you have your, and you know, entry into Murabaha, and you have your purchase dates. So all these are done. What has not happened is that at the end, you will have your calculation and your payment being done. So payment would be at the end of your quarter, then at that quarter, the payment will be basically exchanged, but you will actually will be uh, having this risk of the Murabaha in your, on, on your books for, for this period. So this is something when you have beginning of the period, uh, Murabaha, when you are doing, exercising your your VAD or your DFT, uh, then you will be, uh, you have to agree that, okay, I am going to do the Murabaha from day one uh, on the spot basis, of course. And then I will be basically the profit when it 
that time comes for the next rollover, then you will be basically the payment will be made at that time, and both payments will be there. Unlike uh, the beginning of the period Murabaha, you will also have could do at the end of the period. So you will agree, you will exercise your promise, but you will not really enter into a transaction at that basis. You will be entering in the spot when the time is coming, if three months, let's say date 88, probably you will, you will enter into Murabaha on the spot basis, uh, on the same calculation basis, but it will be end of the period. Where, where it will be done. So you are not really, although your commitment is there, uh, you have signed a binding promise to enter into Murabaha, but you will not be really actually entering into transaction at that time. So you have, uh, I will not, I think, go into greater detail, but you can see later on also the calculations that you have your simple, and these calculations are simple, so that we have not really any issue in terms of the Sharia that you know you have to do it differently. So they are simple calculations which you normally do. Uh, so this is basic, you know, you have FPR with its uh, uh, fixed profit rate calculation, and if we have assumed the 2% fixed profit rate for 30 days period, uh, uh, you can see the amount what it, we are coming out. So it's your capital amount, and you can, can you explain the capital amount? <coughs> Notional amount, is it? Uh, it? It's the notional amount um, uh, in relation to the transaction. So it's under the obviously the profit rate uh, payments will be made will be made by reference to whatever is the agreed notional amount between the parties. So it, it's simply the notional amount as agreed at the time the transaction was first entered into. So I hope that is clear. So if you have transaction, let's say if you're trying to cover 100 million, so you will be doing that? Yes, so, so your notional amount would then be 100 million. Right. And, the, and the, the, the profit rate, if you're saying 2%, would be 2% against that notional amount of 100. And the floating amount would also be whatever the rate is. So Muraba would be for that amount? The Muraba, the, the notional amount of the, of the, of the uh, profit amount payment would be calculated by reference to the notional amount. So Muraba would be the profit amount? Exactly. Okay, so this is what we have. So fixed rate, we are getting 16,438. Uh, we are not actually paying. I'm not going to pay. I'm not going to recover also. So, but this is something, you know, if you calculate, you will have uh, 16,000 odd for the fixed rate for this period. And whoever is doing the floating rate, naturally will do it. And we are, LIBOR we know, and by 2021 uh, will be disappearing. But we kept it in our sort of calculation just for reference point of view. Uh, perhaps it's still being done, so that will lead into, you know, one person live vote, uh, which is not there and realistically, but one and a half uh, plus uh, <coughs> half percent uh, sort of, uh, you know, floating amount. So you are getting about 1.5 percent, which will give you around 12,000. So this is the stream which you will be sort of exchanging these amounts through Murabaha. So one stream will go with 16,000, so somebody is just hedged. You know, maybe he's called correctly and 2%, he wants to hedge that risk he has done. Other one was happy, you know, for his position to cover floating and with the cost of uh, 12,000. Then in case of, so that was for two sales, so you have two extreme streams and like I explained, that we have to do the Murabaha, so to exchange these cash flows, so you have to do the profit, <coughs> the profit cash flow. In the single sale structure, uh, you notice that, you know, this is only one Murabaha. So you have to have a calculation, you have to have a condition uh, which has to be met. So if you are conditioned, if you are calculating, and in this case, if I am the floating rate and I am doing it, I, my sort of, I am getting 12,000, and if fixed rate is 16, so difference is 4, so naturally my sort of, you know, I'm negative four, so I'm not going to exercise <coughs> my work. I'm sort of, it has to be, you know, positive number. So that is, you know, so naturally the Murhaba sort of exercise and receive would be by the fixed rate, uh, which would be done. So this is uh, the difference where you are just exchanging sort of the difference between the two based on this condition. 
uh, that you know you are meeting so you have to have a positive number if you're negative number this means you are, have sort of incurred a cost for this one and that, that you, naturally you cannot exercise your ward uh, which you have given so it's only one ward in that case it's sort of been exercised to claim uh, the difference uh, in, or in the, your profit amount Cross currency swap, uh, like uh, earlier I mentioned, uh, is also very important in terms of uh, looking at when you have even in your Nostro accounts uh, some yen or if you have you know, a transaction, uh, let's say Sukuk, which is uh, your balance sheet is in euro, but you are issuing in Sukuk because you see a greater sort of demand there and greater take up uh, in, in Sukuk. So naturally what you have to do is when you, are, you have to manage your cash streams uh, in terms of, you know, payment of profits when they are coming or, you know, or you know, payment of uh, principal at the end of the period. So these are sort of cross currency when you have also the element of fixed and floating as well, plus you have also the element of actual sort of, you know, your, uh, you know, your nostril balance which you are trying to do if you, if you are doing or if you have, you know, amount particular in your uh, in your uh, account it, which is in euro and your you want to basically hedge uh, you know that risk and want to move to dollars so you have to enter into a sort of cross currency other one would be sort of uh, in the market as you know somebody is always there to provide and he would be sort of looking for dollars uh, like i earlier explained <coughs> with idb if they have yen uh, naturally they need to hedge it and they now sort of mechanism whereby you can sort of uh, hedge the cross currency and the structure in this case uh, it's pretty much you know this, uh, you were following the same like PRS and that was one of the reason we followed after PRS the cross currency uh, is that it's pretty much the same there you can see there are two structures here you have two streams so naturally you will have just sort of a two sale Muraba if I may say so you're not really looking into one because you have actually that, you know, fix and float, floating profit plus your, you know, your uh, euro or dollar what you are exchanging. And what you are happening here is naturally you are not really selling like unlike in forward positions uh, any outright. So you are simply swapping it and covering your uh, currency risk, you know, exposing yourself to currency as well as, you know, the rate of, you know, uh, the profit rate or the reference rate, uh, you know, risk as well. So this is uh, the simple uh, for cross currency. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, like very similar to PRS. You have two sort of, you know, DFTs, uh, and these are two different DF DFTs. And one, you also have to note that these sort of DFTs, what in what if you have same condition and if you combine and it's become a bilateral, then we have a Sharia issue with that. So what cannot be really a contract in that form not a contract like Murabaha or you have agency contract or Usharaka contract and all. So it has to be, you know, a promise you are giving. So that is the reason that these sort of, although there are two wads we are exchanging, but they are two separate wads for two separate uh, reasoning and transactions. So they are not sort of linked in that basis. They are sort of exercisable. Uh, so, so Habib, uh, that's something you want to add on that one or? Yeah, so again, it's, um, I mean, in some ways it's similar to the, uh, to the two word structure on the PRS, uh, but whereas with the PRS you, uh, you, you, know, you may go to the single word structure if operationally um, that works from your point of view. Here with the, with the cross-currency, of course the sort of starting point is people looking for the two different currencies, so in principle <coughs> you'd imagine that people would go for full deliveries, as it were, of the, of the two respective currency amounts for which you need to build in the two WAD, which will then generate those two uh, uh, sets of cash flows on the relevant Marawa transactions being entered into. So this one sort of is structure in terms of you know availability of structures 
is something which has become a common structure to be used in cross currency. So we don't have, and I will, when I move to the FX forward, you'll notice you know, what is the difference uh, between the PRS and cross currency, and where we have slightly more flexibility in terms of the structure. In the cross currency, also, we have every time when you are entering into cross currency swap documentation, uh, documentation architecture is you have to sign in the whole sort of document. Once again, when you're entering into a fresh transaction, so this is at the moment that's which you know what we have sort of put together uh, with, based off the industry you know, the input we received. So if you have, uh, I mean, example, and it's very sort of uh, I apologize. It's a very sort of uh, put it in a. I don't know. You can probably read it a little better than what I'm seeing here. Uh, but this is what, if you are doing, you know, party A is issuing, that's a kook in, in, in dollars, its old position is in euro. So what sort of, you know, uh, and he want to hedge that sort of enter into cross currency. So this is the example uh, which, you know, you can also take and you can look into it. Uh, I think it's better if we sort of have some time uh, for some question and answer. And so you will have, so we would like to give that time. Uh, for that purposes, so I will, you know, skip the actual, you know, step by step products. I think that will be more easier, and you understand these are the simple steps which you have to sort of follow. Uh, and you can see, you know, part A and B, what sort of, you know, arrangement they are entering, and, and the whole calculation you can see is there. Looking at the trade date and also the effective date, uh, so we have to, when we were sort of explaining to Sharia, especially we had to explain a great deal, sort of a differences, and if you recall, we had to put down a lot of things into explanation why sort of we need that explanation. So obviously if you, uh, you know the trade date, you know, you want to enter now, you sign your DFT, but your actual sort of effective date or transaction uh, if, let's say if you're issuing Sukuk and you want to do this, uh, you will probably have it after maybe one week or later. So you will basically sign it, you know you are about to do it, but you are sort of completing your uh, process of, you know, meeting condition precedents and so you are just trying to, you know, sign it, you know, you will enter but you will not actually move to the effective date, is that date when you will actually uh, when the vat has actually become life, so you basically exercise uh, your vat. So I have explained that why you need the trade date uh, mm -hmm. and why sort of you need the effective date uh, for this sort of calculation purposes uh, for cross currency. Again, this you know same process you have earlier sort of enters into MA. Uh, and then if you are looking at, you know, the same tools, uh, you know, uh, sale structure we have to use in cross currency, so it's the same, the, you know, the cash flow movement would be, you know, both ways, one for the currency and the rate which could be fixed and other could be the other currency and the rate which could be floating. And these are the basically same calculation. And here again we have, in this case the capital amount uh, would be your actual the amount, right? So you're exchanging that plus the, your profit. Uh, because this is a, a cross-currency swap yeah. where you are uh, paying both a combination of capital amount and profit mm -hmm. amount. So right. So if you see the PRS, we had there the notional to calculate that and you are entering into that Murabha for that you know, amount of, you know, fixed or floating uh, profit, but here you are actually exchanging your sort of nostro balance, let's say, of, you know, one million dollar, so you are exchanging that one million versus, let's say, sterling. These are the set of things uh, you have to do uh, when you are entering into, you know, first lag, what you need to do, uh, and also in the second lag. Uh, you can see when you're exercising your undertaking and the steps uh, you need to take. Now moving to FX forward. And this one, uh, I think in terms of uh, 
what we have seen uh, of use, uh, pro probably FX forward uh, is more used uh, in the industry, it seems, uh, especially uh, I think by the Islamic banks as well, uh, to hedge various risk uh, and currency risk. Uh, we have, uh, <coughs> in terms of uh, the architecture for, for this uh, foreign exchange forward, um, of course, we have two structures there. One is a single uh, VAT structure, and I'll explain that, and there is a two-sale structure. In this, the difference would be that you are signing your sort of uh, single you know, uh, VAT structure or two-sale. You are sign the main document in the beginning, and you will keep it. So you are not really going to re-sign every time you are entering into a transaction. So for you operationally, you know, it's, uh, it's easier because we have, I think, greater volume there and this is something which when we, we develop, uh, we sort of also uh, learn that this could be a better way in terms of putting it. So rather than your operation and all, they have to sign all the time. They are signing your FX, you know, uh, the main sort of document terms and condition one time and they will keep it. But when you are sort of entering the actual transaction time will come. At that time, you will exchange your uh, DFT or your, you know, single DFT <coughs> or two sale uh, or uh, or you have uh, two unilateral or two uh, double, you know, VAT. Under the single VAT, and gen generally when Islamic industry started, uh, it, uh, I'm doing FX forward some years back, uh, generally it was done on the single VAT basis. Like I tried to explain that at that time, you know, I think uh, we were also getting guidance from the Sharia uh, that, you know, that the VAT cannot be, you know, a contract, so two VAT perhaps, you know, in that form, uh, you know. So market, it started, if I'm correct to say, with single VAT generally being done. With single VAT, you notice that when you're doing, uh, if it's between your corporate client and with the bank, Generally, that will probably would be okay because you are, you have your credit limits and all. Uh, but when you are doing, you know, two bigger banks, uh, they're transacting, uh, then naturally one is giving a binding worth, uh, which is a legally binding commitment uh, to, you know, to buy or to sell that particular currency. But you will not be, uh, basically, other party will not be really legally binding. Of course, morally and all, in all respect, it will probably do it. It will not really be part of the market. But if you look at the legal side of it, single VAT is basically a structure which is being used, uh, you know, like I explained, perhaps in different conditions, it fits very well. So we have our Sharia approval on that one. But that's only one party, maybe buyer of the currency, perhaps, will uh, give its binding commitment that I will buy. And of course, you have certain rates, you have to meet certain condition at certain date. In the two unilateral VAT, which we, uh, and from the Sharia acceptability point of view, which is key for these standards, when we develop, uh, uh, is something which we worked and, uh, you know, uh, Sharia guidance on that one was, uh, was very sort of uh, helpful and, and they, they were able to uh, you know, give us the reasoning that if you have two unilateral VAT, which are not really in basement condition, then they, they can be done. So what we have done is to provide legal sort of certainty to both the parties. You have uh, FX forward for, you know, the both party will have two work binding VAT. Of course, there will be a condition. So one VAT will be exercisable, but it is based on the condition and depend upon the sort of a rate. If you have that strike rate, if you have met, naturally you will be exercising, not the other one will not be, you know, uh, it's no use for them to exercise anyway. And then again, when you are entering to FX forward uh, in single VAT, it's, it's the same process. You know, you have to identify your need. You know, what kind of sort of rate you are looking into it. So that's a whole you know, requirement in the schedule. Uh, you can put uh, you know, what what you need to do. I, I also I think I forgot to mention in the Murahabaha uh, structures for the PRS and cross currency, uh, we have not really given under the Tahawud or as part of PRS or cross-currency any Murabaha documentation. 
although IFM do have uh, standard UNAVA documentation, uh, which meets the other standard setting body, especially AOFI, which is Accounting and Auditing Organization, which issues Sharia standards, <coughs> and also OIC Fiqh Academy ruling uh, that applies uh, to Muraba. So we do have actual documentation, but we have not really uh, sort of produced for that because that would be, we, flexibility has to be with the institutions. Here you are not really have that sort of Muraba, <coughs> you don't need it. Uh, reason being you are exchanging sort of currency and what you are doing FX forward, you are booking your sort of uh, Ex, you know, uh, signing your VAD and exchanging your undertaking and you know what rate, but you will be basically, actual transaction would be, you know, uh, sale would be at the spot date, so that, you know, it's a, like a spot transaction, you know, in, in that respect, although you've agreed that it's allowed. These are the sort of, I, I think I've already explained to you the sort of, uh, the process which has been there. I hope I'm clear if there is any sort of question or we keep it for the end. <coughs> so this is the single sale. If you can clearly see that one customer, uh, you know, is uh, entering into a transaction, FX forward with the bank, customer is giving a VAR, but the bank you know, at the spot date, it simply is not giving any VAR. It's simply going to enter and sell the currency at the settlement date, which could be one month, which could be three months, or whatever like period they agree and the rate, you know, they agree on that. In the two sales structure, like I explained, uh, there is, a, of course, a condition which has to be there. So exchange rate is equal to or below you know, predetermined rate, uh, or if the is exchange rate is pre uh, above the predetermined rate, then you have to basically at that you know <coughs> one VAR will be exercised in this case. So you can see that you have already sort of established the condition, uh, and at that time you you know what rate is there uh, whose favor uh, to be exercised. And unlike single <coughs> VAR uh, structure, you will have both parties exchanging VAR uh, for, you know, their sort of basic commitment into such a sterling dollar commitment. And this is the same which I am sort of repeating again on the single VAR, uh, the transaction sort of flow and the exercise of the promise. Of course, we have uh, Sharia approvals uh, for these uh, uh, documentation, all of the standards. Uh, some banks, if they want to use, uh, we have a process of you know, making sure that changes uh, other than the governing law or credit related, if there are any Sharia related, so we need confirmation of that, so that cannot be changed. Uh, so institutions sometimes can use our Sharia pronouncement. Um, and generally, uh, the process is uh, in the industry, uh, their own Sharia also uh, look at these, but it makes, you know, the work of Sharia also a lot easier uh, than the previously the case. So we can see, you know, in terms of market, creating more liquidity in the market and creating sort of better efficient market, uh, these standards are certainly helping. And have we mentioned about the basic sort of guidelines when we are developing uh, is more on the hedging sort of side of our risk mitigation products point of view, uh, not really from the point of view as speculative. And one, uh, you know, some Islamic bank in particular often have been discussing, you know, with me about, you know, uh, their market making and these kind of sort of activities because at the moment, this Islamic bank in particular uh, have to have, uh, you know, a valid reason to hedge and enter into these transactions. So they have to be a sort of actual transaction, not really for the sort of purpose of making market out of it. So I have this, uh, what basically I, brief, I hope I have been able to explain to you uh, how these products sort of generally are functioning under the Tahawud. I will now invite a friend Peter to talk about uh, on the governing law and you know, the legal complexities. Um, thank you for 
uh, the invite to participate in this uh, workshop and also thanks for thanks to Clifford Chance for, for hosting this. Um, my bit um, in this session is, uh, is about law, law reform in emerging markets, uh, in particular in Islamic jurisdictions, of course, given, given the topic. Um, it's a, a topic that um, trying to yes, um, it's a topic uh, um, that many of you uh, will be familiar with from your work in uh, conventional uh, transactions, um, and it's a topic that over time. Uh, since the Memo of Understanding between ISTA and um, IFM was put in place in, in August 2006, has also come up on the um, joint uh, working agenda for both uh, the associations, in addition to the documentation work that has been uh, described by Habib et Lujla, um previously. So, um, because it has become... Uh, very clear over time, um, also for the participants in the um, Islamic financial markets, that these issues are really key. Um, so I'm going to elaborate on a little bit uh, further uh, on some of the key elements that, that we have been looking at uh, in our joint work with um, IFM. And um, to nobody's surprise, uh, the topics listed on the slides here at the slide on the bot at the bottom are enforceability of derivatives transactions. Uh, and this is in addition to the Sharia concerns that uh, uh, have been discussed at the beginning of the um, process uh, ten years ago, um, uh, five to ten years ago, I guess this, this was the high time of the uh, Sharia discussions as to the suitability of derivatives. This is about the enforceability of derivatives. As a, as a type of transaction, uh, similar to what you have seen in some jurisdictions around gambling provisions, uh, wagering uh, provisions. Um, uh, another obvious point is the clarity of insolvency uh, law locally, in particular the enforceability of close-out netting. Again, a standard is the topic. And then, um, of course, in line with that, uh, the similar um, discussions regarding the enforceability of financial collateral arrangements. And even more so, um, recently in the context of regulatory developments um, that have affected the Islamic financial sector as well and that's one of the reasons why the timing of the Islamic CSD that was mentioned earlier um, uh, was the one it was in March. Uh, by March we had it out so this was also in part of um, due to the uh, to a large extent due to the WGMR requirements and the timelines that come with it. The um, uh, further development I should, uh, I should add is also that um, generally uh, we can see as is the as, um, as is there as an association that <coughs> Islamic derivatives uh, come up more and more in sort of more general queries from across the globe. It's not it's not a um, topic that is restricted to, let's say, the Southeast Asian region or the Middle Eastern region. It's, uh, uh, these kind of queries come uh, in our daily work uh, r around the TMA and, and the templates. They come in from all corners of the world, so that, that, that's certainly a positive development that has happened um, over the years as well. Um, so therefore, um, there are a couple of uh, issues that, that need to be highlighted um, uh, in terms of law reform. <clears throat> One is that uh, the Islamic regulators, um, or the regulators in Islamic jurisdictions, I should say, um, need to be made aware of the interrelation between Islamic transactions and conventional transactions and the reflection of that in their national legal uh, frameworks. Again, from a conventional perspective, that's not a surprise. Um, given the um, evolution of the Islamic financial markets, that is sometimes a discussion that needs to be um, done specifically because not every regulator ha may have thought about Islamic um, uh, transactions and the full extent that these um, may be covered by the existing legal framework or may be affected by um, certain provisions that, that are being um, implemented locally. So um, this goes also into documentation projects that are um, or that may be underway locally. For example, I think there was a reference earlier 
uh, by Jalal to Saudi Arabia, for example, where um, uh, the regulator has decreed that uh, certain types of domestic transactions be uh, conducted under Saudified versions of the um, uh, conventional ISTA agreement as well as the Islamic version, uh, the Tahut agreement. So uh, there I remember some discussions um, around uh, how this all fits, um, apart from the policy decision that has been made, with um, the development uh, in the law reform, on the law reform side, i.e. the legislative underpinning that is needed in Saudi Arabia um, for, um, for these types of transactions to work. So it's one thing to decree that the contract uh, be used, the form, the template, but it's another um, to see if this is actually enforceable in the end. <clears throat> I'll get to that in a second uh, when I get to talk a little bit about Saudi Arabia. Um, so um, there is also an element of education, um, as I indicated, uh, that needs to be applied uh, throughout the discussions. And in particular, we have been trying um, as industry to reach out to not only the local regulators, but also some um, what I would like to call a multinational organization. So this, this, is, this ranges from uh, development banks to um, other sort of similar bodies, uh, supranationals of, of various types that can uh, hopefully help in um, spreading the word um, on, on the need for law reform and all the implications that Islamic derivatives transactions have. Um, this slide just summarizes uh, what is uh, most uh, known and, and uh, very familiar to all of you um, from the sort of conventional uh, perspective. I would like to um, highlight one point. Um, the first one I listed under key uh, questions is, will my agreement be respected and enforced by a court or arbitration tribunal? And um, as um, Habib hinted at, um, it was interesting to see from a general interest um, is the perspective that during the pro drafting process uh, around the Taut and the master agreement um, uh, that the degree uh, for standardized provisions on arbitration, uh, the demand, the degree of demand was very, very high. And this was um, prior to the publication of the TMA which took place in 2010. So um, in the run up to that, uh, this showed us um, if you like, on the conventional side, the growing need for um, um, <coughs> developing standard provisions on arbitration, standard arbitration clauses, not only for the Tahut agreement, but also for the conventional ISDA documentation, which has then um, occurred in 2013 uh, by way of the ISDA 2013 arbitration guide, which provides various sample um, isda fight arbitration clauses for various sets um, of uh, arbitration rules and countries or seats. So, um, so in a way, um, the TMA was a, was a real trailblazer here um, for, for industry as a whole. Um, um, but coming back, back to the topic here, um, the other uh, bullet points on this slide indicate things like conflict of law rules that need to be addressed in a, uh, a, a given jurisdiction. That, need, that, that legal framework needs to be clear. Um, uh, is there any room for um, adjudicators to change the contract from, from the written form to which extent um, uh, does that happen or is it prescribed for by local laws in particular in insolvency of course it goes back to the netting point and then uh, the uh, key elements that uh, everybody knows from the um, derivatives transactions and, and uh, documentation generally enforcement of close-out netting, set of financial collateral arrangements related to this and other ancillary uh, documentation and uh, transactions. Which leads me to uh, the uh, point of, um, it's actually I skipped one slide here, I'm sorry, um, uh, to the point I, I am alluded to earlier, there is a uh, large um, educational element here um, for the lack of a better term, vis-a-vis um, -vis the regulators. Um, and um, we've seen over time that it, it's very helpful to have um, the cooperation of um, 
multinational, supranational organization, multilateral development banks, whatever you want to call it, uh, international financial institution or IGOs, you choose uh, the, the term you like, um, in, um, um, in the messaging this out to the community, in particular the regulatory community. And it's good to see that um, uh, over time the IFM uh, organization has, uh, um, involved, has been involved in uh, these kind of discussions as well with its um, if I could say that sister so, um, organizations at the IFSB and IOFI, so that across the Islamic finance sector, across the various product types that it covers um, and the different associations cover, um, that there is some um, joint effort underway to get um, the word across around law reform as well. I can recall that Habib and uh, I went to an IFSB event, uh, I think once or twice um, over the years, um, and, and try to explain um, the documentation efforts as well as the need for law reform underpinning it. So hopefully that, that will continue. And again, this is something which uh, reminds many of us um, of the um, uh, industry efforts in other emerging markets in other areas um, across the various regions. So uh, no, no, no particular surprise there. And of course, um, the incentives for uh, local regulators to, to look into these things are uh, similar to those uh, given uh, to those uh, in the conventional sector. And uh, it all goes back to, as far as uh, derivatives are concerned, to the regulatory capital requirements as embedded in the uh, various Basel Capital Accords, of course. Um, so there's progress uh, ongoing as well. Um, I guess for in-house practitioners and, and um, law firm uh, members, uh, there's often a, a huge degree of interest in um, what, what, what happens around netting legislation, um, do opinions uh, get published, and where are we actually in terms of netting legislation in the various uh, jurisdictions. And uh, when, we come to, when we talk about Islamic finance, we need to be uh, clear that um, a large chunk of the counterparties are located in both emerging and frontier markets. So this poses particular challenges for the area of law reform because uh, not, uh, certainly not the bulk of jurisdictions that are key uh, to this sector um, can be regarded as good netting legislation. Um, so um, even if we get across all the other issues that uh, I outlined and touched upon earlier, like conflict of law rules and things like that, um, the status of insolvency law in particular, um, even beyond things like gambling and wagering, uh, wagering contracts, the insolvency law framework in each of these jurisdictions that will come up on the radar screen sooner or later uh, poses uh, certain challenges. But it's not like that everywhere. So that's why on this slide we have uh, put up a uh, couple of countries at the top of the list um, as far as netting legislation is concerned. It exists in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, as, as you well know. Um, and more recently the UAE free zones, two of them have been added to this list um, as well. And uh, we have uh, uh, op uh, certain, op is there opinions um, uh, published on all of these jurisdictions, of course. The ADGM one is pending, so in the next couple of days that one will come out, but uh, the other ones you uh, probably were aware already for Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and the DFC free zone in the uh, UAE. There is um, legislation in place in all of these. In Bahrain, um, of course, uh, those of you who have uh, witnessed these, these sessions uh, in, in past years, Bahrain has been pending for a while, and in fact, they were the, the first um, uh, Middle Eastern jurisdiction to enact uh, proper netting legislation back in December 2014. Um, but uh, due to some subsequent events, uh, certain uh, court cases that caused a lot of uh, noise, um, we had to um, suspend or put on hold um, our work towards an ISDA opinion for Bahrain. That is being addressed currently by the Bahraini regulators and the legislator uh, because um, amendments to the netting legislation, to the existing netting legislation, plus uh, a couple of new topics uh, that have caused issues uh, in these court cases, they are being addressed by way of a new bill uh, which is supposed to be adopted, uh, we understand, before the end of the year. So uh, then 
once that has happened, Bahrain will become a full uh, and robust, I say, I would say, a netting legislation, a netting jurisdiction. The UAE free zones we have uh, mentioned already, DIFC and ADGM, um, they've all um, enacted specific legislation and um, uh, this is a relevant um, development uh, for two reasons. One is, of course, certain, certain um, counterparty types and entities um, have the possibility to be uh, set up in these free zones uh, in the UAE um, as a regime that is separate from the um, let's say federal law regime, onshore, it's not the right term exactly, but uh, the, the rest of the UAE. Um, that's one point. And the other is that um, these, uh, this type of legislation um, often allows for certain influence of English law principles, which is obviously very helpful to, to the type of transactions that we are doing here and looking at and, and, and the documentation. So that, that is a positive um, development and therefore uh, we have uh, uh, commissioned opinions and published uh, opinions on uh, the DIFC a while ago um, as well as the ADGM which will come out in a couple of days time. And this has had a positive knock-on effect definitely on the discussions in the UAE at federal law level um, because that's where the, the uh, large majority of local counterparty is uh, based of course. They, uh, many uh, financial institutions as well as corporates in the UAE do not have the option to set up a business in the free zones. So they need to stick to the uh, federal law framework. And um, this, it's great to see that there have been, I think it's two or three drafts now in the middle of this, it's two I believe, um, the draft laws on, um, on netting that have been circulated within the authorities okay. and other stakeholders. Um, so there's clearly a um, trend, a tendency to come up with some solution relatively soon. I should say also that uh, that type of legislation in all of the jurisdictions in the Middle East is actually based uh, and or largely influenced by ISDA model netting uh, provisions. The ISDA model netting act uh, 2006 has been, um, has been influential here. Um, it has been, it had to be um, amended uh, or, or the proposals had to be amended quite uh, significantly in order to cater for Islamic transactions because the ISDA model netting legislation from back then, which is over 10 years old, um, didn't contemplate Islamic transactions. So in uh, several of the jurisdictions on our list, we had to discuss with regulators that they consider um, including specific provisions for the benefit of uh, Islamic transactions because they should not be discriminated against in this context, of course. So, so that's been uh, always, uh, that's met uh, positive reactions, I think, in, um, in every place that we've been uh, raising this. And in, in some cases, in fact, um, the regulators have specifically asked about this without us telling them uh, about this. <coughs> So uh, UAE federal law, uh, let's, uh, you know, this is a, a big development potentially, so hopefully uh, in the not too distant future they will, uh, they will enact something. Um, the other big one, obviously, uh, certainly as far as the size of GCC uh, economies is concerned, is Saudi Arabia. And um, even there, although the pace is much slower than elsewhere, um, there are um, positive developments. We've um, been part of a, a consultation by the Ministry of Commerce and Industry um, who were looking at a um, full-blown uh, revision and review of the insolvency law in, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, they um, helpfully included <coughs> a draft chapter on financial contracts which would cover, which would cover um, netting as well as collateral arrangements. Um, and so this development occurred shortly before the various um, shifts and developments in the um, Saudi leadership and royal family have occurred. So, um, so that has had an influence on the timing. So it's, it's uh, for us a little bit difficult at the moment to assess the timetable going forward, um, how, this will, how this draft bill will, uh, will go forward. But it's, it's, it's certainly still in the uh, legislative process. So um, we have a plan uh, to approach the uh, Saudi regulators again about uh, this uh, particular bill before the end of the year. 
Um, the most recent development is um, happened in um, June, which was in Qatar, where uh, the QFC authorities launched a um, specific consultation on the inclusion of uh, netting provisions in the um, QFC legal regime in Qatar. So uh, I don't think there's a, an official report yet or anything like that there that the QFC authorities have published, but uh, certainly the proposals uh, uh, went very much into the right direction um, fr from an ISTA perspective. So um, unfortunately, they have also liaised with us uh, um, in this context, in the context of this consultation. So it's all very positive um, lately. And then two final countries I wanted to mention um, are Pakistan and Morocco. Um, Pakistan, um, where uh, for almost eight years now, I think, uh, something like that, there has been a draft netting bill for, for seven or eight years already, which was uh, developed initially by the State Bank of Pakistan. Um, it was, in, in effect, a combination of the ISDA Model Netting Act and the um, EU financial or elements of the EU financial collateral directive. So quite an interesting approach. Um, so mixed kind of uh, piece of legislation. Um, it has, um, we were sort of, we had lost hope at some point because nobody knew where in the legislative process that bill had um, ended up and it wasn't entirely clear due to the um, sometimes interesting political developments in Pakistan where this bill actually is, had it gone to the bin or um, is it still out there? It turns out it's still very much alive and now both regulators, the SEC in Pakistan as well as the State Bank of Pakistan, have actually uh, come up with a joint draft um, that they um, had a new step at this and um, came up with a couple of uh, new ideas uh, to be added to this. Um, I'm not sure there's a specific timetable um, as to the adoption of this law, but um, certainly the, uh, both of the um, regulators involved here have agreed on how to go about netting legislation. Initially there was some sort of turf war going on, I guess. Um, you could call it. Uh, now that's been sorted um, and uh, once they have agreed on the final draft, which we understand is about to happen, it'll go into the final uh, parliamentary process. So let's see. Um, so there's hope. And Morocco is actually, um, there's a, um, netting legislation which has been pending. It's been sponsored by uh, a project which is run under the aegis of the uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So this is an example, another example of how IFIs can help in this um, because they also have the idea of uh, developing local capital markets by way of this type of legislation. And uh, Morocco will, um, or is scheduled to um, enact uh, in Q1 next year netting legislation that has been developed um, under the, um, in, uh, as part of this EBRD uh, sponsored project. So, um, it looks uh, good. Um, I should also point out that the um, sort of this education process is not necessarily uh, uh, one-sided so vis-a-vis the uh, legislators and regulators in Islamic jurisdictions. It is actually, it works both ways. Um, so um, uh, if we um, get to um, sort of, let's say, developed jurisdictions or more uh, or less emerging <laughs> Uh, markets in this regard. We often have to point out that um, it is in the interest of legal certainty uh, for that particular local uh, legal system to also include Islamic um, transactions in their laws. Um, so um, that's, that's something that not um, all of the sort of Western, um, if I can use that term, uh, jurisdictions um, will have thought of. So similar to what we observed from the ISDA Model Netting Act, at the time all of this legislation was considered, this type of instrument, even if you had language that was meant to be catch-all in terms of similar types of transactions or so, Islamic derivatives may not fit that criterion. So therefore, um, other countries over here may have to amend their legislation as well in various aspects in order to accommodate for Islamic transactions. And then finally, um, my, um, the, the legal opinions that ISDA and IFM have jointly commissioned uh, to go along with the um, Taut Agreement, so similar to what has happened in the case of the um, conventional ISDA Agreement. Um, so we have published two um, 
uh, opinions for two jurisdictions under the TMA, um, England, uh, England, Wales, plus Malaysia. Um, and there's a third one pending, which we hope to uh, get done <laughs> uh, before the end of the year, I, I, I like to say, <laughs> um, is, is Singapore. Um, we need to, there's a final draft, we need to go through it one more time, and then hopefully it gets signed off. So that's one that um, will be coming your way shortly. And then, uh, just because it is timely, one last uh, remark on uh, collateral arrangements and just by way of, of background, really, um, whenever you have the chance to talk to local regulators uh, or legislators in, in Islamic jurisdictions, if you could keep in mind a couple of international legal instruments that have been developed which, which address some of the topics that we've talked about here uh, earlier. Um, there are a few documents uh, listed at the bottom of this slide, which are helpful um, because then regulators see that this issue we are talking about here is not just some uh, parochial interest by some industry pressure groups or other, um, you know, biased people. Um, this is actually stuff that has been approved by um, um, international organizations, by various uh, international organizations, ranging from financial regulators like the Financial Stability Board to uh, sort of legal standard setters like UNCITRAL, UNIDRA, and so on. And one point I would like to highlight, because it is timely, a timely topic, is collateral, because um, there are uh, huge challenges. Um, so even if we have, in many emerging and frontier countries, some sort of legal framework in place that allows for at least security interest um, to be created, uh, there are tons of, of issues. And, um, there are uh, international uh, instruments available that provide guidance and one of those is the uh, Geneva Securities Convention which um, has a specific scope of uh, um, application for intermediated securities but the rules in it can actually work for any type of collateral asset that is being used um, elsewhere and they have a optional chapter 5 it's called in there which is if you look at it as a standalone document and uh, that's that's why we were in this involved in this process it's really a model uh, piece of model legislation for collateral um, which is sort of similar to what the model netting act is, is, is aimed um, at doing and um, so for um, both um, title transfer as well as uh, security interest collateral, this, this particular chapter provides good guidance for any uh, jurisdiction. Um, with regard to title transfer, I should add that this obviously does not address Sharia concerns, but at least as far as the um, enforceability of title transfer collateral arrangements in, line, in sync with, um, title, uh, with the security interest uh, arrangements is concerned, for that kind of purpose, um, this, this, these model provisions are very helpful uh, to legislators and regulators and also because they make reference expressly to close out netting provisions related to collateral arrangements. So that's I think all I wanted to say and we are um, within the time um, slot so um, time allocated to us so I guess um, are we going into Q&A now? Or? Yes. yes. Okay, Ijlal, can I hand over to you again? Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, if uh, looking at your slide number six, it seems there are a number of legal opinions uh, which we have to address, and we can see, you know, the use of and the importance of uh, the Tahawud document itself, uh, which uh, links up, uh, if I'm correct to say, directly with uh, legislations yeah. which are being developed. <coughs> so naturally, uh, implementation of uh, TMA and its adaptation generally uh, and particularly helps. Uh, Islamic industry uh, as a whole, uh, which is our overall help. Uh, now, you mentioned to me, and I forgot, maybe some of uh, our delegates do know about IFM, uh, we developed documentation and product standards, uh, Islamic industry, uh, mainly capital market, but going into now trade finance and corporate finance. Uh, and we are the only entity in Islamic finance uh, with regulatory heritage uh, to uh, have started this work some years back now. And we have so far uh, produced 10 standards. We also have in Islamic industry uh, two other, uh, there could be several, but two other main one, which is uh, IFSB, which is more in Islamic Financial Services Board, more on the regulatory side, 
and then we have AOV, which is more on the accounting auditing and more so on the Sharia standard. So we have now these key uh, organizations uh, which are helping the industry, uh, but we do sort of need uh, the help of the industry to work together, uh, and that is something uh, we look forward to. So if uh, you have any questions, uh, or uh, hope we didn't confuse you too much and we were able to explain uh, some of the details. So generally, I think. Uh, in regards to the uh, There's a mic just There's coming a mic, down to you. Uh, in regards to the future designated transaction, if the other party fails to exercise that transaction on the exercise date, uh, what are the Sharia basis for uh, compensating the other party? Um, these, are, these are undertakings, so it's up to the other party whether it exercises or doesn't exercise. Um, if it does exercise, then the party that gave the undertaking obviously is obliged to perform, and if it fails to perform, um, then either that will lead you into the default process um, that the TMA provides for, uh, or in principle, you know, there's a damage claim for that. But you know, failure to perform obviously is one of the events of default that the TMA then provides for and, and provides the closeout provisions for mechanism because in the event of default there is no actual breach of a transaction as such because the transaction hasn't happened so I'd like to know on what basis a party can get compensated for not doing a transaction sure so if you look at the um, the, the, the detail provisions of the TMA um, Fail, and, and particularly the events of default, failing to perform uh, a DFT, failing to perform on your undertaking um, in respect of a DFT is a specified event of default. So if you don't perform on your undertaking, that triggers an event of default under the master agreement, under the TMA. And that allows the non-defaulting party, the other party, to implement the close-out provisions of the TMA, covering all the agree all the transactions that are under it, including obviously all the DFTs. <clears throat> so there's a contractual mechanism mm. in the TMA itself to allow you to address this. I think there are early termination events which are defined there. The there are, but 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 in in in, ter in relation to non-performance of a of a word or an undertaking, that's that's the default mechanism that applies. Right. Um, just Very following on from that question, um, my question just is uh, it's linked to that. I think it comes down to the fact that under Islamic finance, you're not allowed to compensate for opportunity costs, and. Uh, just looking at this, I haven't read the agreements myself, but looking at this, uh, you note at the beginning that the, the, that the non-defaulting party is going to be paid the replacement costs uh, of not entering into the transaction. That, that sounds and smells like a, an opportunity cost uh, compensation. Maybe I'm missing something, but uh, if you can explain why that's not an opportunity cost, uh, that would help. We have explained this. I think you may be not there when the beginning, but maybe Habib can again explain. Uh, or I can, maybe you can further sort of. Uh, if you look at it, it's uh, the replacement is then when you're entering into any hedging, your aim is to risk mitigate and for that period. So let's say if you have had uh, it for three years and then somebody uh, with this, you know, termination events, which are quite a number of them are defined in the agreement. Uh, but if let's say if it's default, uh, so naturally early termination triggers, and when early termination triggers, uh, it naturally the other party have to rehedge its position, and it has to go in the market, and it has to find out what you know my position I can cover at what rate, uh, and then there is the index methodology. So it's not that he can just simply you know just 
out of blue do something and just come out with the number. Plus, there is a quantity also being defined, and there is one clause also, uh, which you know covers that aspects. So you cannot overcharge. So it is actually you are charging for the actual loss. In case of when you are going to rehedge the position, it could be that position itself was in profit. So in that case, there is a provision that if it is a profit, naturally it belongs to the uh, non -def uh, defaulting party. So non-defaulting has rehedged, it has some extra which is done, it's a profit belonging to uh, the defaulting party. Uh, but in Sharia wise, uh, we, we explain that you cannot just simply transfer these amounts. Of course, you come out with an index and all you know, you're not, it's not an opportunity, it's just that number is there. So you are going to transfer, so you cannot really transfer. That's why we have this Musavama you know, methodology which basically that amount you transfer, but there is a condition if it's severe, you know, thing like default and insolvency has happened, then naturally maybe it cannot really, the institution defaulting one will not immediately, somebody will pick up because the Sharia requirement is to actually enter into a transaction, Musavama, with that amount. So we have given in the agreement because there are some peculiar things in the agreement which we have to put, but we are reworkable. A one-year condition to transfer that profit. So although Sharia doesn't allow that we can reward somebody who is defaulted, and, you know, in but in this case, you know, it's been allowed. So that's one thing. Other things, uh, all our standards we have, you know, defined uh, this, you know, the payment, uh, these charges have to be actual. So they are not, nothing can be charged over. So it has to be actual cost which has incurred. So if there is any actual cost, then that can be charged. Uh, other than that, you know, you cannot charge that. So there are provisions in the agreement which cover this point. Anybody else? I think in that case, uh, just one question sometimes people ask, so maybe, you know, uh, from here it's not coming, uh, but sometimes we get a lot of queries from institutions, especially our member banks and others also, a lot of them. When you have, uh, uh, you know, do you require, you know, legislation, right, if uh, to close out a position and enter into Musawama or you can just do it, if, let's say it's a non-netting jurisdiction. Uh, and it is going to basically, you know, so do you re actually require that legislation or <coughs> you just, you can, you know, do it? Uh, for the, uh, should I? Yeah, um, for the, ins uh, for the uh, enforceability of clause on netting to be, um, in for uh, to be um, guaranteed, you need, usually need, uh, specific types of legislation. The background to this legislation is regulatory capital relief. Um, so um, to be an absolutely certain to get uh, this regulatory capital relief, you need to um, provide clean legal opinions which confirm the enforceability under local law of this. So um, yeah, usually um, you need specific legislation for this kind of um, situation and question. And uh, I cannot think of many certainly not in the emerging market space uh, jurisdictions that uh, where this would work without so based on legal general, general legal principles without any specific legislation uh, in place so that's why there's a specific need to to enact this type of legislation and um, just just on a side note um, this this affects not only um, emerging markets it's it's uh, been a historic fact that um, every other if not every uh, the developed jurisdiction had to come up with its own specific legislation as well in order to to get that uh, done. Thank so you. for market participants to be able to obtain regulatory capital relief based on positive legal opinions. Right. <coughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, I think we kept you awake also, which is a very difficult task at times. So uh, probably we are uh, taking a break or? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so we are taking a short break. 15, 15 minutes? Or we can make, yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Jan. It's been good. A lot of people.
people registered that you mentioned, but sometimes they don't show up. Yeah, that's So, ladies and gentlemen, Bismillah ar rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Nabiina Muhammad. Attention, please. So. Just to uh, explain to the brother on the previous uh, Session talking about the uh, opportunity cost and why there's a huge difference between opportunity cost and why. From Sharia perspective, there's no issue at all when you promise somebody to do something and you fail to, to fulfill your promise to pay the actual cost of that failure. So, what we are dealing with besides the Musawama concept and all these stuff, the basic principle in Sharia, if the wa'ad, the promise is a binding wa'ad, what you call wa'ad mulzim, eh? and you, feel, you fail to fulfill that wa'ad, whatever loss in, in between that, for example, you promise me to buy something from me in three months time, and within these three months, because of you, I didn't do anything with the commodity that I have which I suppose I can sell it to anybody. Because of you, I didn't do that, right? And then you told me two months or one month before the contract, you don't want to do it again. I will have to go and look for somebody, right, in order to buy what I have, what you're supposed to buy from me. So whatever in care in between that, in between that process for me finding somebody, from Sharia perspective, you call it actual cost. That actual cost you have to pay for it is what you are. It's not the opportunity cost. So I hope, inshallah, it's clear. If any question we can we can discuss, I discuss with others, so we can discuss with you as well. So inshallah, my brothers, uh, of course, the purpose of this workshop is to update you on the uh, IFM standard documentation and product uh, the template development, and to touch on issues that we think are relevant and important to the industry. So we hope, inshallah, you will enjoy this session with these distinguished panelists. Over to you, Mr. Habib. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum and a good afternoon to you all. I believe we had a very, very interesting but very absorbing first two hours, and I hope what we're going to hear now is going to be very light-hearted and keep you guys more interested, hopefully, because you've, you've absorbed quite a bit before. The main thing to know, this session is not only important, but it is the lifeblood of a bank. Liquidity is key. Without liquidity, bank can run into problems, and we have seen what happened to Lehman as an example. So, <clears throat> liquidity is in my blood, and it is in the blood of the banking system. So let's start and see what we have. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure most of you know the structures that I'm talking about here. Muraba, Salam, Wakala, Kalhassan, Misako. These are some of the tools that the treasury people use to manage their liquidity. No doubt, Many of them have risk elements in terms of either credit risk or market risk. And what we're trying to address is to how to minimize those risks in order for us to be solvent, for us to maintain our liquidity and also our activity of the bank. Now, Muraba, as I mentioned, has got credit risk. Muraba is normally short term. But because we are giving out liquidity, that is taking out a credit risk. Similarly, on the salam, there's a credit risk plus there's the risk of the underlying, because the underlying you're going to get delivered in the future. 
So the goods that you can get in the future, unless you've done a parallel salam, you will have the risk of that goods. Uh, wakala, basically you carry two risks. One risk is that a wakil basically performs and can return the money back to you. And then the investment that the wakil has taken on your behalf. Kazakhstan is basically a benevolent fund. We just give some funds and do not expect any return. Uh, and Sukuk, basically market risk, credit risk, etc. <clears throat> anyway, so as part and parcel of those risk reductions, what can we do? One solution is to have some collateral against that. And then the other is to ensure that we have documentation which provides enough protections in case of some other events that takes place, i.e. default. This is a very interesting observation by Mr. Moyeddin from the World Bank. I will highlight three of the main items which I see affects our market. Doesn't work. Hello? Can you see me? Here we go. Promoting standardization. That is what exactly IFM is doing. It's basically bringing about standardized documentation which makes it easy for the banks, easy for the lawyers, and easy for the participants because it is a standard documentation which can be executed pretty much easily and quickly. And also for the regulators that they know what the documentations in the marketplace are rather than having tens, fifteen hundreds of them. Ensure adequate liquidity. And that's what we're trying to address here. And then the final one he mentioned is basically sound risk management. So overall, managing treasury is a very important function. As I said, it is the life line of the bank. And we need to make sure that we manage those risks. We make sure there's enough liquidity for us to keep up the float. And then we have got something which everybody is familiar with and knows what needs to be done from a documentation point of view. So, what does it all do? In my opinion, basically, I said a tool that flows liquidity into the cash and the Sukuk market. Why? I can do certain amount of muraba only because there's a credit limit issue. But if I have collateral that I can provide, then my limit becomes much bigger. So I provide liquidity in the sense that by having collateralization, there's more funds floating about, number one. Number two, because of the collateral of Sukuk, that plays an important part. So when new issue comes out, I know that I have got the facility to raise money against that Sukuk for me to buy that Sukuk. So it helps the Sukuk market as well. So it helps both the cash market in raising more liquidity, it helps the Sukuk market absorption and for the bank to rather than place money in short term just to maybe look at taking Sukuks which may give them high yield as well. Oops. So how does collateralization work? Let's go step by step on that. As I mentioned, we look at Morawa, cash, rich party, prepared to give out his cash as an investment, and there's another party who requires the liquidity. So they do the Morawa, which is the green line. Then against that, the other party provides the Sukuk. If I can work this out. No, it doesn't work over there. Okay. That's a straightforward Morava, which many of the treasury people already do. But how do we bring about collateralization? So we've done the Morava, which is the party A requiring funding, party B providing liquidity, and they do the Morava. These are the flows which many of you know. That's straightforward. All we do now is insert the collateral. So party A gives collateral in a form of a single sukuk 
or a pool of sukuk based on the criteria that has been agreed, i.e. I will only accept single A, I will accept triple A, or whatever. And those collaterals are there as long as the transaction is there. On the deferred payment date, which is the number six, the collateral moves back down from the blue triangle back to party A. All clear? Yeah? If you have any questions, we can go through it afterwards. So what are the benefits of collateralizations? As I mentioned, it's an alternative to clean lending. Clean lending is limited because there's so much credit risk a bank will take. So, so this gives you that ability to take more. It's also credit risk management in the sense that with that collateral, you have got some comfort should something go wrong that you have got an asset that you can possibly look at. And I'm sure uh, Habib will talk later on that collateralization issue as well, uh, as well as Sarah uh, on the other side. It is also a liquidity management tool, right? It allows institutions to take funds in for longer durations or a bigger quantum. Like I said, clean lending is limited. You may do five million for, say, three months, but the bank may give you 50 million for six months, as an example. Central bank intervention. Uh, this is key, uh, because if you look at how the conventional market works, ECB, Bank of England, US Treasury, uh, Treasury they all do money market interventions to repos. So why not for Sharia compliant activity as well? Central bank needs to manage the funding in the market, whether they want to give more money to the system because the system needs it or want to take it away. And this is one of the tools that they could possibly consider for the Islamic banks. And like I mentioned earlier, development of the sukuk market, allowing financial institutions to take more sukuks because they, even if they don't have the liquidity, they can use the liquidity in the market, market against those sukuks. <clears throat> the objective of the MCA agreements. Let's look at some of that. First, enter into Murava transaction, straightforward. The other aspect is margin maintenance. Taking collateral is one issue, but what happens if that collateral value goes down? I need to be protected all the time. So therefore, there is a provision to allow you to basically take more sukuk or more collateral to balance up as what has been agreed. Similarly, you want this to be two-way, so therefore if your collateral value goes up too much, then you can either take more funds from him or ask some of the collateral to be returned. The other element which is very important, because as, as a bank, you may want to trade your sukuk. You may take advantage of the price rise in that sukuk and want to sell it. So the Collateral substitution clause allows you to substitute the collateral you've given again subject to the criteria that you've agreed. You can't basically say, okay, I'll take the triple A and I give you double B. Right? So you've got to maintain that quality. Above all, IFM MCM A is approved by a number of Sharia scholars. IFM has got Sharia scholar panels of over 10, so that gives a wide acceptability globally. And the chances are that those Sharia scholars are on one of your Sharia boards as well. Very important to know some of the guiding notes, which are not part of the MCMA agreement, but it gives you a bit more understanding of what the document is saying. Is it permissible to use bond as collateral? Well, you're doing a Sharia compliant transaction. So how can you take a bond? You have to take Sharia compliant assets, sukuk, equities, etc. Can the seller make use of the posted collateral? The way the transaction has been structured is under a pledge agreement. So therefore, those security collateralized sukuk you cannot hypothecate, 
no use them for your own self or to sell on or whatever. What happens to the coupon received on that sukuk, which is now pledged to party B? Or party, yeah, party B. Well, he receives the coupon in his account. It is now not his sukuk, so he has to give it back to you. <coughs> As part and parcel of that collateral <laughs> management, the value of that sukuk has not gone down because the six months of, or three months of coupon has been paid out. So that has to be replenished. So either they give you more sukuk because the value has gone down, and you've given them the cash away, which was received a coupon. Because that's not your coupon. It, the coupon belongs to the sukuk holder. Does the MC allow two-way? Because you, know, you may say, look, today I am liquid, so I'm prepared to give funds out. But tomorrow I may need liquidity. Yes, you can do that. However, you need to have two separate agreements. One to give, one to take. Governing laws. The standard documentation comes under English laws. But there's no reason why, if you want to use it on your own jurisdictions and you want to do it accordingly, uh, that is something that you can discuss with your counterparties and your legal teams. And make sure you're, you're you're comfortable with that. Now, what are the issue, uh, <coughs> issues as far as margin maintenance is concerned? I've covered part of it already in the sense that if the value goes up, you can ask for some collateral back. If the value goes down, you have to give collateral in. This is all dependent on what your criteria has been. The kind in the conventional market that I have been used to in many years back is basically have a threshold amount. So say basically if the collateral value goes down by say half a million, only then I call for margin or a million dollars or whatever that you feel comfortable because you don't want to overburden one, your back office and also you want to make sure your credit risk is also managed. Regulatory, legal, and other challenges. Uh, I think I'm going to leave the first part to our legal expert. What I'm going to look at is the question. Certain institutions either do not carry sukuk in their portfolio or do not invest in sukuk. So what are the solutions? Obviously, you can look at other Sharia compliant instruments that the other party is comfortable in taking. Right? Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the things that has been happening in the marketplace, where people have taken unrated uh, papers, uh, emerging markets, but then they take a 50% haircut, as an example. So, you know, it's something that you have to agree with your counterparty as to the risk that you're prepared to take. Now that you've got your collateralization done, you've done the documentation in place, you've got the margin maintenance worked out, you can now relax a bit and leave it to the operations to make sure that they do follow up on any further margin requirements whatsoever. So that was a very quick run round of the collateralized market. Uh, as I told you early on, it is not going to be as absorbing as your first session. But I hope I've given you enough to think about and looking at see how collateralization can help your institutions or even the central banks to see how it can be moved forward. So thank you very much. But do visit IIFM website. There are a number of documentations that you can download. It's free. But do become a member of IIFM. You need to support the industry. All right? Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Habib, who will give you a bit of of information on the legal front uh, as far as pledges and etc. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to quickly look at the um, legal structure and, and in a way it's, um, we talked earlier about the credit support deed for the Tower Master Agreement and, and what we have is actually a very similar uh, security or collateral arrangement um, although 
in this case, the underlying collateral is going to be um, Islamic assets of some sort or another, or halal assets, so um, support or, or equities or whatever. But again, as the name suggests, what, what you have overall is a collateralized Murabaha arrangement. So the starting point is there for there to be Murabaha transactions. Uh, Israel explained the way in which entry into those transactions results in uh, the finance receiver acquiring an asset uh, under the Muraba and owing the purchase price of that on a deferred basis. And with that asset, obviously, he, by selling it, the finance receiver is able to raise liquidity. And it's that obligation, that deferred payment obligation, which the finance receiver has, which then requires to be collateralized. And the mechanism for collateralizing it is a security pledge, whatever you want to call it, a security over the relevant collateral assets. Um, so in mechanical terms, and I don't want, there's no need to go through this in sort of huge detail, but essentially you have to have a process, operational process for entering into the relevant Murabha transaction, so the Murabha over the um, over the asset which the parties have agreed and, and the documentation contains the appropriate um, processes for you <coughs> including offers and so on uh, in order to get the parties to the point where the asset is being acquired and, and the expectation though you can change this but the expectation is that it will actually be the, the asset will be acquired in the market um, by the uh, you know, by whichever of the parties has, has been agreed, but often it will be the finance um, receiver who will, as agent, go acquire the asset on behalf of the finance provider. The finance receiver will purchase that asset, uh, and as we said, um, there will be then a deferred purchase price payable. Um, the, the document <coughs> is written... Um, with an open governing law clause in the sense that one of the things that the parties will need to do is determine what the appropriate governing law is. Um, that's important in a, for, in a couple of respects. Obviously, you need to choose, um, but clearly, stepping back for a second, you need to be, and the parties need to be comfortable that the arrangement they're putting in place, in the light of where the parties are, in the light of what the collateral is, in the light of where the collateral is, all of that obviously needs to be something that they're comfortable is going to be an effective security arrangement. And that's why we've left open the selection of the uh, governing law, uh, although you'll appreciate when you look at the document that we've written it in the way we would write uh, an English law document. And the expectation is that often... Um, that will be the relevant, uh, you know, a, a, a sensible governing law to apply in the context of the parties and the um, collateral assets that are being taken. But it is an important point because clearly the effectiveness of that security um, is a critical issue um, and because it's difficult uh, at this point as a sort of template matter to dictate where the assets will be or what they will be, because that's very much something for agreement between the parties. Um, that's why we've left that part of it uh, open in the sense of open and needing to be discussed and agreed. It contrasts that with the, um, uh, with the um, credit support deed in the context of the TMA, where we knew that it was always going to be cash, and we said that document is specifically written in respect of cash collateral, certainly you still have to think about where the cash will be and so on, but you know, at least you know what the asset is here. You've got a, it's, it's rather more open, and, and although there can be cash, I mean, obviously in principle, the expectation is that the, that the collateral will not be cash because clearly that's, um, you're not looking, you know, you are looking to raise cash rather than utilize it. So while you might have some excess collateral dealt with through cash, the, the, ex, the larger expectation is that you'll be dealing 
with non-cash collateral. <coughs> we do provide for regular marking to market in the document, as Ismail said, and similarly also um, substitution arrangements with consent. Sorry. <coughs> Um, and one final thing is that we do, uh, as we know, collateral arrangements of this, of this kind are frequently uh, dealt with through the use of tri-party arrangements. We've provided for a mechanism to include that, although obviously the actual tri-party arrangements themselves will be something that the parties will need to agree. <coughs> so just to remind you, you will need to look at and agree with the counterparty on the question of governing law um, and, the, and the, the appropriate process, formal processes that you need to adopt or apply for the purposes of taking good collateral are uh, identified and utilised. Um, but the assumption is, obviously assuming that you've, you've, the parties have gone through that, that you know, they'll be selecting um, location, assets, governing law, etc., which allow enforcement to be effected on a rapid basis. So looking at things like the financial collateral arrangements legislation in Europe um, and the equivalent legislation elsewhere. And then finally, you also do need to select your dispute resolution forum um, in the same way to some extent as you, as you do with the TMA. Again, that's been left open for the parties to decide according to what suits them and their particular circumstances. So with that, I pass on so we can actually hear some of the tri-party potential arrangements. We will now have uh, Sarah from Euroclear to give us an insight into tripartite arrangements. Uh, I believe it is a very important functionality uh, which many users in the mar conventional marketplace and something that you must, should possibly consider or at least evaluate. Sarah. Thank you. Yes. And thank you for the opportunity to expand a bit the knowledge around who we are and on top of what we can provide also as um, services around collateral management. Um, so first of all, I think um, I would like to spend a couple of words on um, who we are and what kind of uh, business we're managing just to set the scene and then drill down on some of the um, aspects, um, legal aspects and operational aspects uh, that tied up nicely to what Ismail and Habib have been describing until now uh, when we talk about the collateralized Murabaha. So hopefully it works. Okay. Um, so first of all, Euroclear um, is a market infrastructure, uh, core services, um, custody, asset servicing, uh, settlement, and I should say more and more collateral management. Um, we have global coverage in terms of uh, market. We linked up to uh, following the sun from Asia to US and uh, Euro, Middle East, Africa, of course. Um, we do have also um, a global coverage in terms of uh, client space. Uh, being a franchise that spreads across investment bank, uh, custodian, uh, central banks, clearing houses, so other type of market infrastructures. And uh, within this um, market uh, representation, uh, the uh, geographical coverage is equally well represented with, I would say, um, Middle East, Africa, in the region of 11% of our client base. In terms of uh, volumes that we manage, probably just one figure I would like to point out is um, asset that we manage on behalf of our clients as part of our uh, core services. We are um, talking about uh, something like 32.4 trillion worth uh, of uh, assets in dollar value and uh, uh, the variety uh, of it covering um, European uh, um, instruments, uh, uh, treasuries uh, 
And uh, um, also, I should say, more and more, we see um, as the Sukuk market is uh, growing and uh, getting traction when it comes from an insurance perspective, also something like 60-65% of those holdings going through um, our books. Um, and linked to that, uh, the assets that are managed through Euroclear, uh, obviously a key figure to highlight in, in this context is uh, uh, 1.4 trillion uh, of uh, dollar value is actually used uh, by our clients as uh, collateral. Um, collateral today being used across uh, a variety of uh, uh, business activities spreading from uh, standard repo, security lending, uh, more and more central bank operations, um, and, uh, and more recently, as you know, regulation pushing also derivatives business activity uh, over the counter uh, to be collateralized. Uh, we've seen a lot of this also um, requiring um, solutions that are efficient and automated to make sure that um, this part of the business is also promptly uh, managed and collateralized as the regulators are requiring. Um, and of course, uh, more and more we'll see um, a bit of that into also uh, what will flow through CCPs as part of the um, uh, OTC derivatives uh, uh, clear business. Um, collateral is at the back also of other transactions more linked to program like uh, settlement driven um, securities lending and borrowing or uh, street lending activity. Um, so to say that uh, um, we do welcome initiatives uh, as well where more collateral is required regardless of the exposure behind, be it a standard transaction or more structured finance or more related to bespoke uh, arrangements. And together with it, uh, our solution around collateral is completely agnostic around the bilateral agreement <coughs> behind. So we can equally support uh, uh, transfer of title as well as uh, uh, pledge arrangements, security interest arrangements, uh, and in this case, uh, Sharia compliant Muraba um, So this was a bit to set the scene. Now, um, what I think uh, it's important for this forum is to be aware that as market, market infrastructure, we we do have already today conversations with our clients, Islamic banks, but also non-Islamic banks, they are, into, um, they are interested or are using already the collateralized Muraba. And what we understand is that uh, uh, there are specific requirements that needs to be tackled for, to have the full package to give the, the necessary um, they meet all the, the requirements around um, segregation of the assets that are used as collateral, um, protection of those assets, uh, uh, and even more importantly, I would say, enforceability of the underlying pledge uh, when it comes to the bilateral agreement, when it comes to uh, an event of uh, default. And this is to cover pretty much the legal aspect of it, um, but then there is the very practical aspect, uh, which is the operational uh, one. So how uh, clients, once they have ticked all the legal boxes, can actually operationally manage uh, assets that are provided as collateral. Um, and so if I go one step further down in, in the details, um, that's what, what I would like to discuss with you today is um, the depending on how sophisticated the clients are, we provide bilateral solutions where assets can move uh, um, basically as a settlement instruction from one party to the other, from the pledgeor to the pledgee, or in a second I'll touch upon tri-party, which is uh, bringing more automation and efficiency around uh, uh, the movement uh, of uh, um, those assets. Um, before I go into the operational detail, I would like just to go back on the legal aspect. So, 
I was discussing about requirements of um, the uh, bilateral agreements. Uh, Mura, Mura Bahaba, not only, I would say more and more so, generally speaking, around um, asset protection and enforceability. So what we could offer already today, and that's practically used as business as usual, is what we call the single pledger pledge account yeah. structure. Um, the way we um, structured it under Belgian law um, requires basically, um, first of all, to have uh, between the two parties, the pledger and the pledgee, a valid uh, um, agreement. Uh, a, a valid bilateral agreement that can be uh, in any type of uh, um, governed by any type of law, and it can be any type of agreement. Euroclear is not part of that. Um, Euroclear will simply recognize in its book and records that uh, that agreement uh, um, is uh, th that account where assets are held and segregated uh, is governed by a valid pledge. And should uh, there be a, an event of default uh, with the pledge or the pledge can basically uh, take those assets uh, and uh, enforce the pledge. Um, should there be uh, the other way around that the pledge actually um, goes belly up, um, it's a faster way for the pledge or to uh, address uh, the enforceability um, uh, with uh, the administrator. So this solution works both bilaterally and uh, in tripartite. The difference being that in tripartite, Euroclear will step in as an agent also to uh, do all the good things that uh, Ismail has described, uh, described earlier, profit distribution, mark-to-market, -mark, and so on. Um, the, 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 the variation to the theme uh, of, uh, um, of uh, this mechanism is also that if a pledger and pledgee are not quite happy because there is not enough plain level field in case of a default between the two of them, um, Euroclear can step in as also the name on the account uh, acting on behalf of the pledgee. This will uh, basically take away administration risk uh, in the sense that uh, um, regardless of who defaults, Euroclear will step in and distribute the collateral to the non-defaulting party. And uh, this is something that has been is that, uh, um, approved and tested. It's already working as business as usual for the collateralization of uh, derivative transactions, OTC derivative transactions, and it's proving quite popular because it does give uh, uh, that certainty about the enforceability of the pledge and also all the control um, uh, agreements that are required under ISDA in, in this context. So we, we view this as also an opportunity to be expanding into other type of bilateral agreements. And to close, uh, um, uh, I've just described uh, the underlying pledge between just two parties. Um, the same could apply, whatever I just described, uh, also in case uh, there are multiple pledges towards one pledge, and in that case probably the only um, uh, additional comment I would make here is that um, there is possibility for the different pledgeors to uh, keep track of what is sent to that pledge. Uh, there is possibility of account segregation and drilling down further to make sure that your assets are where you think they are, with power of attorneys, of course, as well, available to view that yourself directly. So, um, to conclude, um, what I would like to recap on is um, we are a large um, service provider when it comes to collateral management. We can service uh, a variety of uh, client base uh, and different agreements uh, and we are actually quite keen to continue the conversation and see how uh, we can further support also Sharia compliant bilateral agreements uh, with uh, existing tools uh, that proved already to be uh, working absolutely fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Let me finally introduce you to Lawrence Oliver from DD Capital. I had the pleasure of working with them 17 years back, providing uh, commodities uh, for the Marabah transactions. Uh, and he's still here, and I'm still here. <laughs> so Islamic finance is growing, okay? <laughs> so, um, Lawrence, if you can give us an update as to know what is happening in the Marawa field mm -hmm. as the market have expanded, uh, let's see you know, how we're doing forward, yeah? Of course, and I'll, I'll, I'll stay sitting if that's all right. Yeah, sure, sure. Slides. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, had the pleasure of working in this market now for about, well, it's, it's coming on for 25 years, so uh, yeah, I'm feeling my age nowadays. But um, it's been an interesting time, um, and certainly I've been very fortunate to witness the way that the market has evolved over a, a, a long, long period of time now. But what perhaps is the most interesting fact of the lot is the fact that if I turn the clock back 25 years to the very first Sharia audits that I sat in, um, uh, with the likes of Qatar Islamic Bank, etc., in the, in the in the good old days, um, we were being told at that time that the use of commodity murabaha served a purpose, but solutions, alternative solutions, had to be found, and that's a message that I hear over and over again, and have heard for many, many, many years. But based on the volumes and the transactional activity that we, as as, as one of the leading intermediaries in the Islamic financial marketplace, <coughs> that we're fortunate to see on a day-to-day -day basis. What is very interesting has been the fact that majority continues to be the most significant uh, liquidity management tool that's employed by the banks. Volumes have just continued to increase to the extent that I would say at, at, at this moment in time, more than ever before, liquidity is principally uh, flowed through the Murabaha structure. Um, the tenors for these transactions nowadays, majority of them are, are short term. Um, so most of what we see is in the short date, the one to three mar uh, month market sort of place. Um, sometimes we see something, uh, transactions extending out to six months, um, but that's more rare. Uh, the vast majority is in the one to three month space. And currency wise, interestingly, we, see a, we, we do see volume across all of the local uh, currencies. Um, but the vast majority remains in US dollar. So I think we then have to say to ourselves, why, is, uh, why have we seen these volumes increase? Well, of course, that goes hand in hand with liquidity in the market. If there's liquidity in the market, Murabaha is the most convenient tool to be used. Um, I think one of the key components that has perhaps coincided with this increase in volume has been the increased use of fintech in, in our sector. Um, fintech and the use thereof has revolutionised the way in which commodity Barabara is transacted on a day-to-day -day basis and firms such as my own and others in our space employ a range of electronic solutions nowadays that have made the entire Marabaha process a much, much more straightforward uh, and convenient tool to use for liquidity management purposes. Uh, if we turn the clock back a, a number of years, Marabaha, I think, was... was, was frequently viewed as being, it served a purpose, but it was an inefficient tool to use in so much that there was an awful lot of paperwork required to support each transaction with toing and froing of it offers and acceptances, etc. The use of fintech um, has made that entire process far, far more efficient, and a transaction can typically be arranged now literally within seconds, where there is, whereas in, in the olden days you could have been looking at 20, 30 minutes, even an hour to book a transaction once you've completed all of the to and fro of confirmation process, etc. So I think looking, moving on now to collateralised Murabaha, um, we've started to see an increase in the use of the collateralised Murabaha structure, perhaps not as much as we might have expected, but it is clearly showing signs of becoming a, a recognised convenient liquidity management tool. Um, I think we've seen, particularly in recently in challenge markets, um, that it is being increasingly used, so that's an encouraging sign. I think, though, from uh, the future success perspective of, of the structure, fintech is the key. Um, Sarah, what you've been talking about earlier and, and the structures that you use, I would imagine fintech plays a key role in that management requirement, and I think for industry now, the, perp the, the next step is to look at how we can bring all of the various components that we have, because we have the front end uh, treasury management solutions, your Reuters, your Bloombergs, etc., that are providing the liquidity management tool at the front end of the transactions. Sitting in the middle, you have the intermediaries such as ourselves that are arranging the commodity element to make the Sharia compliant uh, p part of the transaction as efficient as we possibly can make that. And then you then move on to looking at the collateral management and the role that, that uh, entities such as yourselves clearly provide in a very efficient way. I think the ultimate solution now for Islamic finance is to work out 
we've evolved these various independent arrangements, how can we bring all of that together? And I think that's a dialogue that we need to look at moving forward. But I think, I think the message I wanted to, put, to pass on is Marabaha continues to be the key liquidity management tool that's used globally by institutions in the Islamic market space. FinTech is clearly the way forward, and I think it's for us now to work out how we bring all that together. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, I know we want, we're trying to find a solution to replace Marabah, but we don't want you out of job anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> now, <clears throat> since the market has been evolving and maturing, have we seen or have you seen any short term, in the sense, overnight type Marabah? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a vehicle that more and more institutions are using. It, and it's been a case of... Uh, all parties coming together to work out how we can make that happen because for the institution providing the overnight, typically, and we're probably as much to blame as anyone really, the cost element of the transaction used to make it a very inefficient model mm -hmm. and certainly something that, that would not work for the banks. We're now finding ways that we can work with the banks to create solutions. So more and more institutions now are looking to create these overnight vehicles. The yields, etc., aren't particularly attractive ultimately, um, but there are solutions out there now, and more and more banks are, are, are bringing that to the market. Good to you. Can we open uh, the floor for any questions? No? Sorry? Just you know, one or two, they say, just to see whether they have any issues with the presentations that we've had, either from legal or from the market perspective, or even from an uh, operational perspective. Dr. Uh, Shikta. Speak. Microphone, microphone. Uh, you may have to share it to this case. Go ahead. Yeah. Let me initially say something, and then maybe Habib may want to add, I don't know. <clears throat> As I mentioned early on, that these collateral are pledged, and there's no hypothetication, so therefore you cannot use them. That's a simple answer. Anything to add to that? Well, uh, so, uh, just to be clear what you mean by tradability. So if, I mean, you, know, you have Sukuk, so they may be listed Sukuk, for example, whatever, so they're obviously transferable um, in the way that the relevant asset is, equities or whatever it is. Securities created over them. As, uh, as Ismail has said, they're not, you're not permitted to reuse, you're not permitted to rehypothecate under the terms of the agreement. Um, they are security that you are holding as security for the relevant obligations. And either they get returned because the obligations are performed or if you have to enforce, obviously they'll be sold in an enforcement. So, so that's the scenario. I, I, I'm not 100% mm -hmm. clear of your, your yeah. question. You talked about the sub, sub, uh, substitution of the collateralized assets. So I assume there should be a mechanism whereby if you wanted to sell that collateralized asset, you should be able to substitute with a similar sort of quality of assets. So that's how the question came about in terms of the tradability because suppose by default they are traded within school as well as the equity. So Correct. Sure, basically if you look at you know, the fact that I mentioned in my presentation that there's a substitution element there and as long as you uh, provide that collateral according to agreement and I mentioned basically you, you can't take away AAA and give them double B so as long as you've got those arrangements you can basically substitute and, and do it. This is the beauty of this collateralization is that it has that flexibility for you to continue your trading while still having the liquidity. And but, so just more specific. No, but he wants to sell it in the secondary market of his position, of the sukuk. Is that right? And then substitute it, yeah. Yeah. Can he do that while 
Well, well sorry. The, yeah. I th I th no, no, sorry, sorry. I think we're getting Confused. caught up in, in, in some of the details. Sorry. I, obviously, I can decide I have, if I'm the provider of the collateral, I may do a trade. If I, in order to fulfil that trade, need to recover my collateral that I've, that I've pledged, then under the terms of the pledge, I, there is a mechanism of substitution. It requires the pledgees or the, the collateral taker's consent. Right, so if he doesn't consent, you're going to have to find some other solution. If he's willing to consent because he's happy with the alternative collateral that you provided, so on the basis of that alternative collateral, he's willing to release that collateral back to you and you can then use it, then fine. But it is, it's a security arrangement. You, know, you will need his consent to do that. So clearly, if you are going to trade it, you, know, you need to take account of the process that's, not, that's going to need to be um, followed in order for you to be able to get hold of those securities back or the collateral back. One thing, let me yeah, finish just to touch base more on the operational element you are bringing up indeed. So if you go, for example, for a bilateral solution, then it's you that need to basically send an instruction, um, make sure that that piece gets out of the account and manage the, the onward delivery. If you use a, a tripartite mechanism up front uh, between pledgeor and pledgee, you agree the set of eligible collateral sukuk as well as equities. And uh, once you have agreed that up front, that's sort of encoded in the system of the tripartite agent. And at that point, if you now decide to remove uh, uh, the sukuk you're interested in to deliver it and trade it elsewhere, your settlement instruction will be picked up automatically by the tripartite machine, which will substitute uh, with equivalent eligible collateral and onward deliver the one you have substituted uh, wherever you tell us to deliver it to. So that's the more sophisticated approach, but gives uh, a lot of uh, comfort that everything is managed based on an agreement that has happened before. I think I'll take your questions. Well, you need to agree things with your counterparty regarding substitution. As I said, substitution will require consent. Clearly, if you are going to agree something like that as collateral taker, you need to be sure that you're not prejudicing your security. So you need to, you as collateral taker, need to make sure that whatever you're willing to agree to, you do in a way and at a time that protects your security. But as long as you are clear about that and you are effective on that, then you can obviously agree things. So the consent is at the point of time when you wish to substitute or when you sign Well, that's, that's a matter for you to agree as collateral oh, taker. It's it's a matter. Exactly, yes. And it's gonna, you'll need to look at that in the context of the security that you're taking. One more, okay. I've got one more. <laughs> The pleasure remains the owner. Pleasure remains. The, the pleasure. Yeah. yeah. You're the owner. You're the owner. From that leads to a question that if the asset is held in the, in the name of the pleasure, then does that mean that the asset is held in the name of the pleasure and not in the name of the pleasure? Does that mean that the pledge asset actually needs to be Sharia compliant because the pledge is not the owner of the, the asset as such? Does it need to be Sharia compliant? Let me, let me put it the other way around. <coughs> First of all, you're doing a Sharia compliant transaction. So you want to maintain that, number one. Number two, should there be a default, then what are you going to do? You're going to execute a bond to realize your money? That's the question. Well, it depends how you, what, what is bond? You know, well, basically a non-sharia non, non compliant instrument. As far as bond is concerned, that the principal amount, there's nothing wrong with the principal amount. Yeah? What is wrong with that bond is the interest payment. So if your collateralized asset is equivalent to the, uh, uh, the principal, I 
I will leave. It cannot be, according to the agreement. Okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Then we'll take one more. That's it, okay? First of all, it's good to see your clear bank getting involved here. It was good to see some kind of back in the days of ILM to rejoice and have the interest. And uh, Lawrence as well. I mean, I can see where this marriage. There's a synergy there. Yeah. You know. <laughs> That's a, to be honest, um, the well, there is a market practice somewhere, right? So, um, if I look in the repo market or other type of uh, more established um, sort of um, <coughs> bilateral activities, uh, um, there, there there are some standards, there are some uh, basics that are followed to establish that and to avoid that you go. Uh, overboard. Um, we wouldn't necessarily step in, I would say, at this stage because obviously we, we are neutral. We are just managing the operational side of things. Where we want to have a, a, an active role is more on once the agreement has been reached, whatever the haircut, whatever the collateral that sits behind being Sharia compliant or or not, depending on who are our participant, is uh, making sure that that value is maintained. So that's for us where our key role is uh, and where participants entrust us with that. Um, and for that, obviously, we look ourselves at reliable sources in the market at that point, official sources, uh, uh, where we can derive uh, the pricing and the liquidity um, to make sure that the valuation that we applied um, corresponds to what the market also expects to see. Yeah. If okay. I may add on that. Yes. So from that perspective, not all, I mean, not to say that the expertise is not there, but as a guidance right, perspective, mm -hmm. Right. Um, for the parties to consider. Yeah. But it is up to them, I concur with you, yeah. that they would need to agree on that particular I, I think that, that that's something that we can definitely share based on what we see in our books as a um, sort of reference. Um, Again, I refer to um, other institutions like IGMA, for example, they also publish uh, quite a lot of data uh, when it comes to, to certain products. Um, uh, that are also available. So I think that, as you say, the idea is that as these kind of transactions become mm -hmm. sort of more and more used and popular, and at the back of it uh, uh, there is uh, a clear need to manage the collateral that follows, uh, they will all come together. And at that point, we would have enough also to share as data, possibly, to, to, to give a guidance at least to clients. Yes. Brother, uh, you need just to say that. Mm -hmm. then the, the, the pricing becomes easier to do that. Mm -hmm. If you have longer term supports, yes. the, the haircut aspect becomes yes. more Yes, I was saying basically, as far as the haircut is concerned, it is basically down to the two parties themselves. Uh, even if you look at the conventional repo market, the only so-called inverted comma standards are on government securities. For example, when you're doing treasuries, US treasuries, there's a standard 2% haircut. Right? So until we look at what it is, because the haircut is an element of the counterparty risk and the underlying collateral risk. Mm. Right? So you, so you can't just say standard, you know, I take this. It, it would be more so collateral risk rather than counterparty risk. That's what you're yeah, no, no, to be honest, I look at my counterparty first. Collateral, I don't want to touch it. Sure. I don't want to touch it. Sure. I want my counterparty to be there. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Your last question, sir, before we close, otherwise, no, that's going to be delayed. Let me go to my answer very quick one. Um, under the tri party repo, if there's a downgrade in the collateral, uh, would Euro clear for <coughs> both parties? Yes. Uh, is that part Yes, it's part of what we do, and we've seen that already happening, by the way. So we would uh, um, uh, reflect the downgrade, which means that uh, um, the auto-select, which is the machine that operates tri-party, will pick up that uh, one party uh, is not correctly covered, and therefore will uh, top it up with uh, 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 other eligible collateral to bring it back to the value that the... the the deal requires to be collateralized. Yes. Thank you very much for very in, for an inactive, not but active <laughs> participation. Uh, really enjoyed it. Any more further questions? We'll be there at lunchtime. Uh, you can ask all of us. Thank you again, and thank the panel thank thank you. You for an interesting session. Thank you. I think Alhamdulillah they explained, but from Sharia perspectives, from Sharia perspectives, substitution, there's no issue with that. There are two things here. When you take the collateral, the taker or the, 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 the uh, institutions that take the collateral cannot use the collateral at all under any circumstances from the Sharia perspectives. All right? If the collateral uh, giver, after giving, submitting the collateral, wanted to use the collateral, he can't do that without the consent of the collateral taker. This must be very clear from Sharia perspective. Even if he wants to substitute the collateral, he has to consent, to seek consent from the collateral taker. So this is uh, what I wanted to be little bit clear from Sharia perspective. Okay, of course, since morning, alhamdulillah, you've been uh, listening to technical things and all this. I think it's time for you to hear something little about Sharia also, because uh, Sharia is the backbone of the Islamic finance. Without Sharia, there's nothing called Islamic finance. So, Mr. Jalal, he's my boss. He's supposed to start, but uh, he asked me to start so he can come and polish my mistakes in China. Eh? <laughs> we are learning with you. So we are, I personally going to talk about the general uh, parameters on the IFM published standards. To date, IFM has published, as you know, and for those who don't know, 10 standards. And each standard has what we call Sharia guidance on what is allowed from Sharia perspectives and what is not allowed. Today, we choose to talk on only one standard, which is uh, unrestricted Wakala agreements. But before proceeding on mentioning the general Sharia rules on Wakala, 
Let me briefly say something or say something on two, on two things. The reality and Islamization of financial products for those who know and those who don't know, especially those who are new to the industry. Contemporary Islamic financial products are frequently developed through one of the two different approaches for those who don't know. First, to identify the existing conventional products, means conventional banking products, and remove from them, which is generally accepted according to Islamic principles, and remove from them elements that are not accepted under Islamic law, such as uh, interest, which is, uh, we call it in Arabic, riba, or gharar, uncertainty, and etc., so that they are able to comply with the Sharia rules. Let me give you an example. For instance, hedging contracts that we have now. These are new concept of contracts. We say, call them in Arabic mustajidat, something new. When I say new, means these type of contracts do not exist during the legislation, the earlier stage of Islamic legislation. This is during the Prophet and after him, 4,000 years ago. And the second thing that Islamic banks do is to apply various Sharia principles in order to facilitate the origination and innovation of new products. So let me give you an example. Murabaha, we have a contract called Murabaha to the purchase order. In Arabic, for those who speak Arabic, we call it very Murabaha al Amr bi Shira. This Contract, of course, Murabaha do exist during the Prophet and after the Prophet 4,400 years ago. But the innovation in the Murabaha contract itself is something unique. So this Murabaha to the purchase order consists of three aspects which do not exist during the legislation years back. Murabaha is a normal sale first. al al Adi is normal sale. And then you have in it promise from a customer or client to purchase. And then you enter into the sale of Murabaha itself. So this is something new that do not exist before. And as an innovation, our scholars work hard to bring it you know, into existence. And others such as uh, diminishing musharaka, musharaka mutanaqisa, and leads to own and others. All these are something new. The second thing that I want to mention before going into the uh, wakala is the IFM Sharia harmonization strategy and application of the fundamental Islamic principles and maxims. In our work in IFM, we realized that the rapid growth of the uh, Islamic finance and banking over the years and the introduction of complex products and structures no doubt require a Sharia harmonization. As some of you may hear or <coughs> know that certain jurisdiction, especially in the Islamic world, there are certain understanding of certain products. So to achieve the necessary Sharia harmonization, IFM has followed a clear strategy on this aspect. What we do is that we form a Sharia board composed of many different countries, especially Islamic countries, even and beyond Islamic countries. So when you see the IFM Sharia board, composed of many different Islamic countries from Asia to Africa to Middle East. And this strategy, of course, and approach assisted in the harmonization of the Sharia recently. This was something that we Also, what we do during the process of our work also as IFM 
we rely on certain Sharia principles. Because for you to come out with these kind of hedging products and other liquidity management products, you need really a very <coughs> deep thought in order to do that. Some people may just sit, as I understood, especially some scholars, some part of the world, just criticize, say this is not allowed, this is allowed, this is not allowed. But during our course, our work, we deeply take into consideration certain Islamic, fundamental Islamic principles and maxims in order to achieve what we want to achieve, in order to accelerate the development of the industry. Let me mention some of these principles, Islamic principles for your knowledge. <coughs> One of the famous and fundamental Islamic principles, let me say it in Arabic first for those who can speak Arabic. It said, الأصل في الأشياء الإباحة إلا ما دل دليل على تحريمه In English, everything is permitted in Islam except those things that have been expressly forbidden by God Almighty or Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So it is not permissible to claim, as some, some people do, to claim that a mode of transaction is unlawful in Islam we say haram, or is lawful because the origin of everything is halal unless you have evidence from the Quran or, the, or from the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad saying this really is not acceptable because we have the red line that we can, you know, go. And another great uh, Islamic maxims that we take into, you know, consideration which says, al hukum ala shay'i far'un an tasawwirihi, means judgment is to be based on knowledge and understanding. For you to say that hedging products or whatever, I mean, cross currency or PRS or FX is not acceptable under Islamic law, you have to understand it. This, unfortunately, some part of the world, certain so-called scholars, they don't even understand the subject, the contemporary way of doing business. Just give a uh, judgment that is not acceptable. So this maxim is there that for you to judge on something, you have to understand it, you have to have knowledge in order to pass a judgment. The other one, it said, The real reason for contract is for the objectives and not for the literal wordings. For instance, some people still call the hedging products as, head, as derivatives, which in IFM we are trying to avoid it because of some people they don't understand. The moment you say derivatives, Islamic derivatives, you use the word derivatives, they really trigger something. Yani. So we are trying to avoid it. That's why we call this TMA document Tahawud, Master Agreement. Or Tahawud means hedging. It's the same. So this is saying that whether you call it tahawud, or you call it hedging, or you call it derivatives, is the same as long as the underlying transactions are Sharia compliant. That's the main thing that we have. That's why you find in many countries they call Islamic, some of them call Islamic banks, some of them call it, you know, participation bank and all this. There's no issue on this at all. And some people may raise a question that why all what you are doing, you are taking it from conventional and Islamize it and make it Islam. What is the problem with that? There's no issue with that at all. And this is what we are trying to educate people. There's no issue of taking it from somebody as long as whatever you take is not contradicting the Islamic principles. That's why they say, say thousands, thousands of years ago, ago of course, in Islam, which, which said, Al hikmatu dalatul mu'min anna wajadha akhadha. A believer is encouraged to acquire and take wisdom from whomever from whomever, as long as it does not contradict the principle of Islam. And we know that the origin of this uh, hedging and all this stuff is conventional. So what is the problem of taking it? As long as we can Islamize it and make it, you know, Sharia compliant. There's no issue from as, as far as Sharia is concerned. So now, let me just uh, briefly, I just mentioned this, let me just talk on this uh, wakala. General Sharia provisions on Wakala. Wakala 
It's an Arabic term. In English, means agency, as you know. And it means the act of one party delegating the other to act on its behalf. <coughs> Up to here is clear to everyone in what can be a subject matter of delegation. This phrase, from Sharia perspective, not anything, everything that you can ask somebody to act on your behalf. This phrase means that. For instance, you know that as Muslims we pray five times a day. So our salat, these five times a day, even though agency is there, I cannot ask somebody to pray on my behalf. This is what subject me, in what can be a subject matter of. I cannot ask somebody to pray on my behalf. So it's not open. Agency in Islam is not open. Okay? And you know that every year we fast month of Ramadan. Of course, based on certain condition, health condition and all this stuff. If I can fast, I can't ask somebody to fast on my behalf. And basically, Wakala contract is a non-binding contract. When we say non-binding contract, we may, people may just ask, I mean, raise some questions and all this, but inshallah we'll explain. You know, I don't want to take much time. So for both parties, what we call principal muwakkil in Arabic and agent wakil, any one of them can just cancel the contract. That's what we mean by uh, non-binding contract. But sometimes it may become a binding contract which we're gonna explain inshallah. And wakala in general, the key elements of wakala in general is the form of the agency which is an act of delegation of the right to act on behalf of, of the other. And then you have the subject matter of the contract, which is the underlying transaction for which an agency is entered into. And the two parties, we call them wakil, and wakil means agent and the principal. And there are types of wakala. Wakala is not just only one type. There are types of wakala, but we mentioned just only three. These are relevant to our documentation or our uh, wakala documents. Wakala could be restricted or unrestricted. Wakala. In Arabic we say muqayyada or mutlaqa. And wakala could be a binding or non-binding. Lazima or ghair lazima. And wakala could be a paid or non-paid. Wakala, wakala, bi ajr or biduna ajr. So, if wakala is restricted, then in this case, it must remain restricted and adhere to what has been agreed between the wakil, means the principal and the agent. Hence, the wakil has no right under any circumstances to violate what has been restricted to do by the wakil. For example, if the wakil means the principal who is investing his money, ask the the, 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 the principal asks the agent to invest in certain assets. He has no right to go and invest in other, any other than what he has been instructed to do. If he did that, he will be liable for whatever happened. And if the wakala is unrestricted one, in this case, Sharia principles and market practices should be observed. And the IFM unrestricted wakala agreement is based on unrestricted wakala agreement. The question is, we said wakala, sometimes it's non-binding contract, but sometimes maybe a binding contract. When would wakala become a binding contract? From Sharia perspectives, when would the wakala is a paid wakala, wakala with fee, you pay the agent to do the job, so this wakala is, will become binding. When the wakil commences a transaction that cannot be discontinued, wakala become binding. Even though in principle, the wakala is non-binding. But in these cases, wakala will become binding contract. You cannot just cancel it like that. And when the wakil or wakil undertake not cancel the contract within a certain period of time. And in any Islamic contract, Offer and acceptance are very crucial. It's a condition. 
So in the Wakala agreement, the appointment of agents by the principal constitutes offer and acceptance the moment you appoint, it, appoint him. And the role of the wakil must be very, very clear as well. So now, IFM, we published unrestricted master wakala agreement. Why we do that? You can see the objectives. Maybe due to the time constraint, because it's the lunch time, I can see people are yawning. So better we uh, escape. You can read it, inshallah, the objective, why IFM you know, really uh, uh, published these standards. And the key elements also, of course, besides the other general key elements, these are the key elements of the documents. To, this is the final, I think second to final. All the products that we published, all the documents that we published, in order to help the industry to understand the product and the subject, IFM produced what we call operational guidance memoranda. The idea, the objective of this operational guidance memorandum is to help the industry, the indiv individuals, especially those who are new in the, in, the, in, the, in the new jurisdiction to understand the subject. And certain things, Due to legal requirement, we cannot mention it in the document itself. Even though we have footnotes, always I have been, mashallah, we take the presence to put footnotes in the documents to give further explanation on the document. Beside that, we have this operational guidance memorandum. So there are key factors that may need to be understood and from in the Wakala context. Wakala, according to Sharia, is a contract that considered to be a trustee, based on trust. Means the wakil, the agent, is not liable for anything. He can guarantee your, your principal. This is the basic Sharia ruling on wakala and mudaraba and others. This we call them the contract of trust. I trust 1,000, 1,400 years ago, this is what they do. Then people, mashallah, are close to they are more close to God Almighty, I can say. Now, of course, we are close, but we are not like them, of course. Yeah. So people trust each other. I trust you. I can give you my money based on Wakala. Tomorrow, you come and tell me that you lost, you lost the money. Based on that trust, I know you, 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 have, you, are just, you are close to God. I can say, okay, this is from God. But now we cannot do that. The contemporary era is very difficult, especially in this modern way of transaction. We cannot do that. So, the wakil can only be held responsible for indemnity when the damage results from negligence from Sharia perspectives or breach of terms of the conditions of the contract. Other than that, he can guarantee your principles. Contemporary scholars think about this. And given the unrestricted nature of the arrangement, the wakil will not have access to the required information facts or circumstances to assess the validity of a loss event. He can't do that. Now, you can't just come and tell me that you lost my money just like that. Or bank A tell bank B I lost your money in the investment. So based on this situation, which do exist now, something that we know, and we have many cases. The recent one is this Gardana gas issues and all this stuff, you know, we know that. So many of the contemporary scholars are of the view that the burden of proving a loss to the satisfaction of the muwakkil should be shifted to the wakil himself. So you see your next slide, I think. Yes, yes, I'll come to the next slide. Yes, should be shifted to the wakil. The basic principles, muwakkil or the principal he is the one who will work hard to see how you lost my money. But contemporary scholars said, no, the wakil means the agent, he should tell me how he lost my money. He can just come and see. So this trend reflects in the Fiqh Academy conference, Fiqh conference from Islamic financial institutions held in 2009 in uh, Kuwait. In the conclusion for this meeting, in this regard, that shifting the burden of proof to, from wakil to wakil, that transferring the burden of proof to trustee means to wakil 
will indeed help, the pro help to protect the investors' funds and provide confidence and certainty. The transfer of burden of proof mentioned is, is quite different from asking the wakil to guarantee the principle or the outcome of the transaction as this is considered to be against the Sharia principle. As I mentioned earlier, you can't guarantee the principle of the wakala. Also, asking the wakil to bear the burden of proof in the case of claiming loss is something required, something is needed, especially in our days. We can just leave it like that. The last thing that I want to mention is that what we mentioned in our unrestricted, what we mentioned in our operational guidelines, which before many people in the industry, they don't know about this until we really clarify about it is that whether can conventional financial institution use this IFM master agreement? Means can conventional institutions act as wakil? Before, many people think the conventional banks cannot act as wakil. As, yes, as wakil. Yeah, the simple answer is yes. From Sharia perspective, there's no issue that the conventional bank has act as wakil, provided certain provisions, of course, certain conditions are met, such as uh, to invest the Wakala funds in Sharia compliant manner. Uh, secondly, the conventional institutions must have a Sharia about to supervise, to oversee what they are doing, and all the times also during the investment period to ensure that they have Sharia compliant asset that at least equal or more to the investment amount. So to conclude, finally, the contemporary modern Islamic money market and transactions are primarily set up to help Muslims individual and organization to finance their businesses. So it's very, it's a mistake, somebody to think, especially this situation we have it in certain part of the world, still some people believe in the masses that Islamic banks they should act like a charity organization. No, they are not. They are there to make money and do business. But we, they are encouraged. Eh? The money they are earning, the profit they are making, eh? to use it in charity things, in funding students, in whatever good things that they can. But they are not a charity organization. This is what we are trying to, the message that we are trying to tell people. And then also, the contemporary modern Islamic finance also in general, it has the same purposes as conventional money market practice, except that the only difference is that Islamic one, we have to do it in accordance with the Sharia principles. And the conventional, of course, they have their way of doing things. That's why we have that alternate, alternative. The main objective of having Islamic bank, of course, is to provide alternates to Muslims to do business in accordance with their principles. Finally, Wakala structure, of course, and uh, an arrangement should stick and comply with the general objective and principle of Islamic law, means that whatever be a Sharia, uh, contradict Sharia such as interest, we call it riba or garar uncertainty or maisir gambling, should be avoided. Also, the subject of the matter of the Wakala transaction should be clearly defined and documented, means that the subject matter of the uh, wakala should be should not be something that against the Islamic principles such as alcohol, pork, or whatever. Inshallah. Allah wa Muhammadin wa Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for listening uh, patiently, and uh, also I uh, happen to be the last speaker. Uh, I will try to keep it uh, short and as well as uh, I hope uh, some of the things uh, which Dr. Ahmed mentioned, but I will now put it in more clearer and more technical uh, how this is really working and uh, why sort of both uh, we have seen now since morning there are sometimes structuring alternatives are limited. So you have seen certain hedging products that we explained uh, can be done you know, without Murawa. Then you have seen collateralized is done because we have to use under Rehen or 
uh, you know, uh, collateral, we have to use a debt type contract. That's why that was developed for the Muraba. Uh, we also know for, uh, if you look at broadly from the global standard perspective uh, to come out with the repo which exists and under GMRA of ICMA, uh, it's uh, something which we still are trying to do. And we have done a paper if somebody know it or if you recall some five, six years ago uh, on alternative to repo. Uh, that's a good paper if to, for you to see. And these standards like unrestricted is uh, one of those which has we have seen a much faster take up uh, because of several reasons and I'll try to explain how it is working without guaranteeing your principal or profit but why, why it has become so useful. We have seen by central banks uh, been used. In fact, uh, collateralize also there are certain central banks uh, which are currently considering. We have seen also public consultation of Bank of England uh, which they have uh, done which they have used both collateralized Muraba and now it's more narrowing down to unrestricted Vakala which uh, we have developed. You have to see a uh, couple of things which I think uh, to make it clear to you when uh, you are entering you are not really and Dr. Ahmed was trying to explain that you are just giving your money and you will never see it back so that's not the case when you are entering into unrestricted Vakala. Of course, the roles of party, we know it. one is investing, which is called Mokil, and other one is basically going to manage the fund, which is a vakil. Unrestricted vakala is that vakil has the discretion uh, of to manage the fund. So that is something, you know, I'll try to explain on the technical aspects, especially on the accounting side, which is very critical also for this kind of arrangement. We have to also uh, two ways to have the pool of assets. So that is very critical. Whether you have a co-mingled pool, that will you know, define you know, from the accounting purpose and uh, regulatory per uh, treatment, capital adequacy treatment will define this agreement. So there are two ways to do it. Some banks do it on co-mingled basis and some are doing it on segregated pool basis. You have indicative rate and which, which can be done uh, in uh, unrestricted Vakala, so it's not something in Mudarba we have slightly different uh, way uh, to do the rate. We have some, you know, sharing of profit, so it's become a little different uh, and compared to unrestricted Vakala. For interbank market, this was more suited. Uh, if somebody will say Mudarba is also similar. Uh, then you have uh, any loss of, uh, is naturally from Okil, but point to note is that it's not only negligence, here we are talking about informing and I will try to explain what that informing means, how you know legally liable you are uh, as a vakil, uh, that that's make this arrangement more sort of com uh, cohesive. And then you have, uh, in case of default, a mokil will rank paripasu, of course with unsecured uh, creditors. This is your co-mingle general pool if you have. When you are taking Vakala, if you have co-mingle arrangement, the way you are doing it, naturally here the FinTech also plays a very important role. So banks generally have to have this operational setup and within their system. So you have basically under your equity, uh, you know, other liabilities, you will be having, you know, this Vakala. So it becomes a part, so you cannot really segregate. So that is also pointing us towards, you know, your balance sheet item is going. Then you have commingle assets which could consist of interbank, Islamic treasuries, uh, sukuks, you can have these sort of things as a commingle pool. And then relate to sharing of you know prorata, what you agreed uh, indicated profit. And also you have to see uh, a related charge in, in value, if change in value, sorry, it happens then what will happen. So that is also something we have to see if there is a value change. Uh, and that's where the informing thing comes into play. And then we have vakil fee, which is generally what Dr. Ahmad was mentioning, that to make it a paid vakala, it's more of a uh, binding contract, right? Mm -hmm. So that is where the fee, fee could be very small. So it's not the profit we are talking about, it's a small fee to enter into the agency. So it could be $100 or something, a smaller amount. So, but to make it, you know, that is the recommendation. So it's a paid vakala in that sense. Incentive, of course, you have given some indi indicative, and as you can see, your commingle asset pool could be producing 
more than your sort of uh, what you have really indicated. So that is incentive you, one can keep. Of course, at the same time, when there's a relative value change, that's where you know the things will come. That you know, if it is you have indicated two and you are now going to meet one, that's where you have to inform. That's the liability being created for early termination. So you have to keep that in mind that that is where you know you have to see. Segregated pool could be, uh, I think, uh, one way to do which, which, which gives you a very clear idea. Here, all the discretion you can see is with the vakil, unlike restricted, where it's, it's more asset management type. So there is no role by vakil, simply takes and takes orders. Here it's simply now segregated, you sem segregate your capital vakala, you have a segregated pool for this vakala, which is generating profit. And the other things, as I explained, remain the same. Then in terms of, uh, if you see the operational guidelines and like we mentioned about uh, burden of proof, certain things you cannot bring it into the contractual agreement itself. So those have to be put in the operational guidance memorandum. In this case, we have a very comprehensive operational guidance memorandum. There are about 34, 35 uh, different guidance we have provided, including Sharia, some legal and some market practices. So you have to basically Sharia comply, like we mentioned the pool. Uh, this is Dr. Ahmed actually has covered about the financial institution. And this is the case, I think, for Bank of England when they're developing, looking at, you know, non-Islamic financial institution and Dr. Ahmed already covered. So I'm not really going to go into that. But one thing you have to see is the, the actual profit when indicative. So we have given condition what will happen if the rate is less, because you have to inform, you can early terminate. So it's not somebody has invested in unrestricted vakala, and at, uh, later on vakil comes after one month and says, "Sorry, I have lost hundred percent." We have seen if, if somebody will recall uh, what five years ago I think Long Bank and uh, PID Investment Dar, they made this excuse Investment Dar at that time. This standard was not there. That this is not Islamic, but there is no basis was there in that claim. Uh, it was exactly the same arrangement where they have to inform and you cannot just say that, you know, I, 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 I'm, I, I don't, I cannot, I'm not weighing, it's not Sharia compliant, it's not true. So here there is a sort of a liability to inform and mock kill can early terminate, or if he feels that I'm okay with quarter percent less indicative profit, I can continue. So it gives you room, you cannot really lose, you know, your all what you have invested maybe it could be the smaller amount. And if it doesn't inform naturally, uh, it has to also, uh, you know, uh, is liable to really pay legally. And this early termination, uh, I've already spoken about when, you know, uh, there is a reduction, especially in the rate uh, indicative, then Vakil has to inform it's under obligation. Uh, to you know, investors that I'm, I'm not meeting, so it's up to you to decide or if you want the funds can be returned. Late payment amount is of course, uh, uh, you know, when it's, it's paid, but there are no sort of late payment charges in all in this case. Their actual charges can be only recovered. So our, our standards have a very extended clause for late payment. So this, these are very Actual and also there is no nothing about uh, opportunity cost which was mentioned earlier, these kind of things. So they are very well defined terms which we have put in all our standards are on the same lines. Uh, you have of course when you are entering into uh, offer and acceptance uh, in the schedules. One thing is another uh, thing is uh, about the our arrangement in Islamic finance uh, is about the transparency which needs to be there. And that is something, in some cases, uh, uh, you know, these kind of arrangement uh, in the contractual document, there could be, you know, requirement that maybe perhaps before you are entering into or during that process that you have a full business plan. What is your investment pool, uh, you know, strategy, what, where you are going to invest, but generally, banks don't really share that information. 
And that is one reason why this kind of thing is not part of uh, the contractual document, but we encourage uh, when the banks are entering into this kind of arrangement, so they should have clarity. At least the vakil or you know investment taking entity should at least provide some information uh, that what he is going to do with this fund, what kind of pool it has, and that help in the business plan. These kind of things are useful, but from Sharia reasoning and all, it's not part of the main sort of document. But we encourage that you have to you know, at least ask when you are entering into this to to know you know what you are getting into. <coughs> Level of subordination, of course, it depends uh, about, earlier I mentioned about the commingle or segregated pool. So how it is done, so that is something assessment can be made where the subordination level will be. Uh, in this case, if you have sort of commingle and it's unsecured, uh, credit is, uh, will be, it's falling under that. So it depends, if you have commingle, it is, becomes quite clearer. Segregated, you have to do certain assessment for that. Re regulatory capital uh, treatment, again you have to see in terms of, uh, it's a credit risk counterparty of course, uh, when you are entering uh, into this arrangement from regulatory requirement per perspective and that is what the classification is there for investment accounts, uh, but AOV also. It also, if you're looking at it now, we are talking about uh, accounting treatment where, you know, this commingled especially will fall, uh, whether it is an on balance sheet item, I have mentioned earlier, restricted is off balance sheet item because of, you know, the way it is, Vakil doesn't have any discretion, doesn't use his, his balance sheet, it's not part of that, it's a very segregated arrangement. Uh, in this case, is, case, we have, you know, what we have is, you know, something which is targeting us or indicating us towards, you know, when you have Cobangel fund into uh, segregated or into, co into on balance sheet treatment and the capital adequacy uh, will fall uh, on that basis then if you sort of, uh, you know, uh, entering into this arrangement. And depends upon your, you know, pool, how you're doing it again, the Cobangel or segregated. You are uh, further into this subject, if you want to see, you are saying the Vakala pool is commingled. Uh, there is no uh, restriction on decision making ability of Vakil. So he is basically using his own discretion. Uh, Mokil relies on ability of Vakil uh, to generate profit. Again, he is not instructing like in case of a restricted Vakala. He is simply relying on Vakil. So everything Vakil is doing for him and it is using uh, you know, its own balance sheet items. So, Vakala is on balance sheet if you do on this basis the analysis. And one thing is there that AOFI of course is developed Sharia standard as well as accounting and auditing. They have not done specifically for unrestricted yet. But I have earlier mentioned even Bahrain Central Bank has uh, introduced this facility based on IFM standard. And by the way, this facility now is being done for the shorter tenure, you can go for longer but it is not done overnight also because it gives you a lot of flexibility. So what in Bahrain specifically, this facility is used on the overnight basis also, uh, which is something, you know, very useful to note. So that's why even AOFI has not issued yet specifically on unrestricted vakala because each standard setting we have our own uh, role to play and we have our own mandate to develop. So we went ahead you know, looking at the industry requirement uh, to develop that one, but that something which specifically if you try to do uh, and find what is there, if AOF accounting uh, ruling, you will not find. Uh, but at the same time, since we don't issue any accounting ruling, because that's the AOF, we did the accounting assessment of our document itself and the agreement where it will fall. And I was trying to explain to you you know, the basis why it will fall into on balance sheet category. And this chart is the final chart which you can see uh, on your left side, my left, so your would be 
floor would be left also. Uh, you can see that when investor is making all the decision, uh, the separation of assets is not the case. It's uh, uh, assets are seg seg uh, segregated because the investor has decided. It tells the, uh, the vakil, these are the assets you have to buy, and these are my assets. Generally, they do commodity murhaba, which is I don't know why you use the vakala route, but sometimes it is done that way. It's also in case of uh, in case of restricted vakala. And then have, uh, FI doesn't have or Vakil doesn't have any uh, authority really in terms of how these assets are, you know, then it purely relies on the instructions. So this is naturally asset management time product. This is falls into off balance sheet. But if you uh, look on the right side, you will notice that investor relies on the Vakil. So to generate the profit. So this is something which he's relying now. The discretion moves from the investor to the basically vakil, which is you know investing and managing it. Then you have the commingle pool, especially when you are commingling. Naturally, you are commingling with your own balance sheet items. Specifically, if you have segregated, like I mentioned, that some as you know more assessment need to be done. But commingle specifically. It's basically you are you cannot separate when you have something in your balance sheet. You cannot really take it out. It's part of your own balance sheet items. You have mixed your vakala with capital with others, and your asset pool is also pretty much not segregated. It's not ring fenced, right? And like in case of segregated, you have to ring fence that one, or you have to title transfer in in that case. So they here is not the case. So it's on balance sheet as well. My colleague is indicating that we are reaching, and I am sure everybody is hungry, so I'm, uh, I will be ending now. And then, if you look at it, and then how you know it, this item, I think the last one on the uh, you know fund received under structured investment vehicles, that is something I, I don't think so always happens. But that's also, if you have this case also, that is also on balance sheet sort of treatment which under IFIRS and both AOFI would fall into. So this is something which uh, some of the things uh, which are peculiar with unrestricted vakala but very important uh, for us to note that why you know this arrangement is not simply that you're entering into something without guaranteeing profit or without guaranteeing any principle uh, and you will be very hesitant to enter into which gives you now a very solid sort of a arrangement whereby you can safely enter without and with Islamic principles that you are not really fixing the you know profit interest rate but you are you have different sort of ways to control your your uh, risk basically in terms of entering into it. Uh, Dr. Ahmed also mentioned about a burden of proof and we actually wanted this burden of proof to be part of the legal document. But then our legal counsel uh, advised us that it's basically more need research need to be done from the legal perspective uh, in this respect. So we kept it into the guidance memorandum. But that's something if you burden of proof legally is also on Vakil, then it's, he doesn't have you know that negligent and he can easily sort of say that you know I I'm, I'm not going to pay. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the fundamental sort of things which developed in this product uh, which has become I think uh, quite widely used uh, not only in GCC I think his, uh, his role is increasing and I see a potential in uh, UK market as well uh, looking at the Bank of England uh, consultative paper and the second part especially uh, if, uh, we have seen that this is something which has been referred of course for any uh, arrangement there are some uh, additional things maybe had to be put in, which might be, I think, Bank of England might have to do. But general sort of conceptual thing is uh, what uh, is this document or with this standard, uh, which I have misproduced. So with that note, if you have any question, uh, I don't have the lunch menu, so don't ask me that question. So is there any question, anything?
Yes. Do we have any data what's the market share of the We, I think as a standard setting, we always try to see, you know, from our implementation level. Uh, we did some, uh, you know, a year ago, some market survey on that one. So that's where we found out that unrestricted uh, is, uh, you know, it's been used quite, you know, that uh, the pace was quite fast in terms of implementation. Uh, but actual numbers, what we are now trying to do, uh, which may take us, uh, I think, one or two years, uh, is uh, since uh, we have a regulatory heritage, we are talking to some regulators uh, and trying to develop uh, uh, basically a uh, template where we'll be trying to capture, uh, you know, through regulators possibly that how much is flowing through, you know, these kind of products and restricted vakala and Urahaba, what, you know, hedging, what kind of volumes we are seeing. So over the period, I think uh, maybe we will be able to answer that more precisely uh, once we will be able to capture that. I think that will take us a little time, but we are looking into that possibility. Because Murahaba is a little easier, uh, if you see, you know, you have a, your sort of money market side, now you collateralize, so it's difficult to take it out, but then you see Murahaba used sometime in Sukuk also. Uh, so that is sometimes easier and it's been done. So we can see, you know, how much it is there. But these kind of products, I think, especially even FX Forward and these kinds, that will probably we need to, you know, that's what we are trying you now to do something in that regard. And uh, finally, we uh, also are now, uh, just for, since you are here, uh, very quickly, uh, from my same perspective, what we presented to, Today is the standard we have published. Uh, we didn't do on the commodity Murahaba, that's a very basic one, and it's already, you know, <coughs> uncollateralized Murahaba has covered there. But that's one standard. But we are now developing standard uh, into trade finance related. So risk participation is our uh, project which is ongoing at the moment. And if you are an institution, obviously you are, or if even legal firms. Uh, you would like to join the working group or take part in the consultation. We encourage membership, of course. Uh, we are non-profit. Uh, we'll be happy to you know, include your name in there. We are also looking at it, and some of you may have taken the Sukuk report. So we do, that is the only research we do. And every year now we are starting a standard on Sukuk documentation. It's a fairly you know, challenging task again, uh, which we would be starting very in the near future. We are also looking into some other areas, uh, like uh, if some of you may have heard uh, that uh, World Gold Council and AOFI in Bahrain has issued a gold standard. So emphasizing what is, is possible with the gold. Uh, since IFM mandate is on the documentation and product side, uh, we are looking into some consultation and eventually standing, uh, developing some standard into the gold related. Uh, products uh, and also the agreements. Uh, we are also now would we'll be going in next three years. Our plan is to uh, go into syndication area. So you will see something which we'll be doing, and we'll be doing consultative meetings. The reason I am telling you to encourage you to be part of our exercise, both at the consultative phase, which is not really public, but we invite you know, key scholars and institutions and legal firms and others, and then. Uh, we are sort of, you know, in the process of uh, at least three consultative meetings in course of next uh, till next year, mid-year, I hope. And then hopefully some more standards will be seen. Uh, we hope uh, risk participation for funded and unfunded facilities uh, could be end of this year or beginning of next year. So with that note, uh, unless you have some more questions, so we can you know, end this uh, workshop. I hope we are able to provide you some The uh, only question is that what menu do you have for them? That's that is the question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my colleague with Smart will know. I, I didn't look into that. It's too clear. I it's leave it to my team. I try to do the only technical shape. So, <laughs> but thank you very much. I'm sure it will be good. Our host is uh, Clifford Chams. <laughs> we are thankful to all of you.